we are talking about the new cube. The new cube that they're going to have in Saudi Arabia. Riley has been talking to me about cube, possibly you too, Seamus, for the last week and a half now. He will not stop. He's he, cube-pilled. I have been hearing about cube from Riley for months, even before Saudi Arabia announced this project. He's a, he's obsessed. <laughs> so we're going to be talking all about the cube. Cubes, about cubes. Um, That's right. Someone built a cube. And once you build the cube, you know, you got to put some people in that cube. And that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah. And then if they go into a room that's uh, that's that's not that's not marked to the prime number, they get taken apart by acid. OK, Justin, sorry about that. Uh, you're recording on your end. I'm recording now. I'm now recording. Sick. Perfect. I don't need to clap. It's fine. Clapping is totally unnecessary. Instead, we can just start the episode and say welcome to another episode of Lucky Paper Radio. My name is Andy. I'm a little bit out of breath because I was just on the floor trying to figure out some tech issues and move cables around. But I'm here, as always, with my co-host, Anthony 27 Maddox. That's me. That's what they call me because I always go 27 in my own cube drafts. I went on the Wikipedia page for the number 27 to try and figure out like a cool nickname for you that related to 27. Like but a sportsman's number or something? I don't know. I went to the Wikipedia page. I figured there might be something there about 27, but it turns out the only thing I learned is that the Spanish alphabet has an extra letter. I mean, it's not extra for them. It's normal for them, but it's one more, <laughs> le- one more letter than you and I might think They it might have. say that we're deficient it's a letter. It's a 27-letter alphabet, and uh, I didn't know that. So, you know, every day you learn something new. Yeah, you went 2-7 in this uh, draft we're going to talk about today because we're spending this episode recapping a rotisserie draft that we did at Magic Con Philly. Well, the draft we did before Magic Con Philly, then we played our nine matches at Magic Con Philly. We referenced this briefly on the show before, and we have a friend here to help us talk through this draft. The man, the myth, the legend, Justin Parnell is on the line. Hey, Justin. Hey, what's up? Uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. Um, happy to be <laughs> That's here. Not true. That's not true at all. That's You've not been true on the, at all. You've called before. before. <laughs> But not for all the listeners. They don't know that. You're 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 breaking the illusion. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, it's very nice to meet you, Justin. You seem like such a cool guy. Thanks. Did you guys watch that panel at MagicCon Philly? Those guys are really all great and handsome. And okay, I gotta tell and, you, Justin. So they we... talked and they 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 talked pretty good. You know, they talked real good. This this kills me. We went to our local like cube night. We go to the same local game store every week and play cube and have been doing it for I don't know a year and a half at this point. Pretty much every single Tuesday. And I don't rub it in, okay? I, don't I know. I'm it. sorry. I'm not. I don't mean to rub it in. I'm just saying that we were there, and it's then fine. this like new person was there. We're always trying to get new people there, so it's always exciting when someone new shows up. And this guy was like, "Oh, I'm from Philly. Uh, I actually saw your panel." He said this to Anthony. I actually saw your panel at Magic Con, and uh, now I happen to be here playing cube with you. How weird is that? He recognized Anthony from the panel. Didn't recognize me at all. The whole night went by. The entire time had no idea that I was involved. <laughs> it was pretty very funny to me. You weren't wearing your uh, the star, Anthony, the star of the show. I mean, I I, I think it's a sign I did a good job as a moderator because I didn't hog mm, the stage. Mm-hmm. You were you were a real crystal goblet. I exactly. I was framing you all perfectly. So much so that this guy couldn't forget Anthony's beautiful face. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that that's a that is that truly is a compliment. Like in all seriousness, you're supposed to just guide everything along, which you did, and then let everyone else shine which I think that they did. Also. Yeah, I liked our panel. And the video is up on YouTube, which I don't think I mentioned on the show before, but the video is up so people can go check it out if they want. I will say that we didn't really like make the panel for the audience of this show. If you listen to this show and you already like Cube, then you might enjoy the panel. But really, we tried to make it for like a very broad audience of people that might not know what Cube is, might think it's too hard to have a Cube, just trying to like make the case for the format more broadly. So with that caveat, if you haven't checked it out, you can go see Justin Anthony... Parker and Gwen talking about the merits of Cube at Magic Con Philly on YouTube. So maybe more important than watching it is send it to your friend who's not quite into Cube exactly. yet. Exactly. Do that. Start spreading it around. Uh, sh- share, et cetera, et cetera. Justin, you were yes. the uh, main organizing force behind this rotisserie draft. Have you done something like this before where you rotisserie drafted leading up to an in-person event and then played the decks once there? Oh, tons of times. We, I've done a lot of road history trips. I've, I've gathered as um, much, yes. I don't know the number. It's somewhere between 40 and 50. And I would say a good chunk of those, 10 to 15, were probably in this man. Where leading up to, we usually did it for a Grand Prix, oh, right? Gotcha. So leading up to a Grand Prix, we would draft, we would draft online in the same way in Google Docs, just like we did, and then play it out. 
for uh, for the whole weekend. So I've done this a number of times before. I've done it with eight people. I've done it with 10 people. I've done it with nine people where we did three teams of three. That was wild. Ooh. I would not recommend it. The logistics Team of like draft. doing everything and working. Yeah. I, I, you know, that's that's one when you're like, we've, we've tried it all before. We've <laughs> done a rotisserie because it's like the same group of people doing it. We're just like, let's, we have nine people. Let's do something weird. And we didn't decide, hey, you can just do a nine person rotisserie because it literally doesn't matter the order. <laughs> right. Right. You're doing a round robin. Play, so, so yeah, it doesn't matter at all. It could, couldn't matter less. Uh, yeah, we did three teams of three. And the thinking going into that was uh, the juice was absolutely not worth the squeeze because a rotisserie draft is already very mentally. I don't want it's not exhausting necessarily, but it requires a lot of brain power. I mean, a giant to, open to information do. draft is a, is a big thing where you, you feel yeah. like you messed up if you missed something that somebody else took or you know, we weren't following along carefully enough. So it's definitely it can demand a lot of attention. I can say from my perspective, so imagine it was doing that. Justin made it look easy, but that doesn't mean it wasn't uh, it wasn't exhausting for some of us. Well, you know, my time was put uh, put in for those previous 40 or so drafts to get to get to this point. So I I did have a pretty good idea of like how things were going to go even though I haven't drafted this cube before but many many years ago 10 11 12 I don't know some some a decade plus ago I actually wrote an entire series for Star City on rotisserie drafting cubes I I, I it was a three episode series of articles that I wrote and I actually went back and looked and I was like I wonder if this stuff still makes sense and it was still like a lot of it still holds up now because a lot of it's just about like what people are doing and the type of cards that you should go for and the general ideology of how how cubes are kind of laid out in a rotisserie setting and we'll get more into that i'm sure some of that stuff will come up but yeah so i've i've done this a lot i've talked about it a lot i've written about it a lot it's been a long time i haven't done a rotisserie draft in i don't know probably like probably four years i think the last time we did one was 2019 yeah you know pre-covid yeah and I uh, hadn't had a chance to do one since then. So nice to get back on the wagon and feel pretty good about it. I know that not all of our listeners are going to know what a rotisserie draft is. And if they haven't already turned the podcast off, Justin, can you just explain what a rotisserie draft is for somebody that's never heard of it before? So traditionally, a rotisserie draft is where you have an a certain number of cards, oftentimes done in a cube. Sometimes you do it for an entire set. That was actually the original the way that it was done is you would take an, an entire set of magic and then draft the entire set. And it is a done in a snake draft, kind of if you are familiar with fantasy sports, like fantasy football or fantasy basketball, where one person picks, then the second person picks, then the third person, and you're all picking one card each. And then when it gets to the last person, they pick twice, what is called a snake, and then the seventh person picks, then the sixth person, and then so on and so on until it gets back to the first person. First person picks for their second round, then they pick again for the third round, and so on and so on. Now, we did, and what I recommend people do, is set a number of picks for people to have. It is possible, and I've done it before, where you rotisserie draft an entire cube. That could be 360 cards, 450 cards, 540 cards. You do the whole thing. Ultimately, I think that is a large waste of time because you are going to be able to get out what you need card wise for your decks in the first top half of any of those we did for this rotisserie draft we did 36 picks so anthony's regular cube is 450 cards approximately is that yeah right? it's actually exactly 450 cards right now but it has floated around in the past okay so we did 36 picks over 10 people which is 360 cards that means that 90 cards were not drafted for this cube and that is generally the amount that I recommend for people, even though it, it is logically, you're like, oh, 45 picks, because, you know, when you're doing a regular draft, 45 is the number that you end up with if you do the traditional three packs of 15. But in a rotisserie draft, you are choosing from all of the cards available, so in the entire cube. So all of the, the cards that you want to be able to draft are available. It's not like you're going to not see something or not have the chance to draft something in the draft. Right, it's not like because, because the... Uh, everything will everything will you be You don't drafted. have to deal with the randomness of packs, so you end up just with some extra things in the end of pack one and pack two that aren't, you know, necessarily in your colors. And you also don't have the effect of maybe you speculate on something that turns out not to be open, so you end up with off-color cards in your pool. Well... Well, well that's that fair. Could that, but not that actually could happen, I would say. Like, you could... I mean, we had in this particular draft a 
But that's a self-inflicted <laughs> win. I maybe didn't play my second pick main deck, is all I'm saying. I was in that color, but I did not end up in the deck I expected to end up in. So I think that one is a little more possible. But yeah, in general, every pick is a conscious pick from a very big pool, which means that you shouldn't have any chaff in your available card pool. 36, I think it felt tight in, a, I think, a rewarding way. One thing I, uh, one thing you can love or hate about rotisserie drafts is when you're drafting a bigger pool, say closer to 40 or something, 45, eventually you get to a point in the draft where somebody just starts hate drafting. They're like, I saw that player, mm -hmm. you know, staked out this aristocrats deck or whatever, and just assumes they're going to get grave crawler for free because nobody else is going to want it. I'm just going to take it from them because I, again, have perfect information. I get plenty of picks from a giant pool. I'm not worried about my deck having playable cards. I actually think I'm just going to start taking key pieces from other players. And that only happened here a little bit because I think at 36, most people, can't, when you factor in fixing lands, didn't have their like main deck locked down until picks like 30, 32, 34 or something. So it wasn't like there was a abundance of hate drafting, which again, some people love it, some people hate it. Yeah, I think this this size of pool worked yeah. out really well. I kind of think that there was just just enough of the hate drafting where it was like a little bit of an extra spice in the draft, but it wasn't a main feature. Gotta of keep it. you honest. Gotta keep you honest. Yeah, you know exactly. And and that's why I really love thirty six for exactly those reasons. Is you are forced to use all of your picks because they are all premium picks. If you have forty five, the draft is going to go the exact same way through the first thirty six picks. Yeah. And, a 45 and will those draft. last, you know, nine picks actually matter for anybody? Probably minimally. I would say minimally. You're looking at, like, low-tier sideboard cards for, like, one specific matchup. You're looking for hate drafting. And I just don't think that that's worth it. I think people's time is spent doing other things. But at the end of a draft, especially if you're not doing it in person, if you're doing it online like we did, man, the end of the draft really slows down. Even if you're doing, like, two picks at the end, which I am not personally a fan of, it's still, it is it is more difficult to get people energized to draft your 39th pick where your deck has been done and you're like poking through the rest of the cube to find like a sideboard card for what's like your third worst matchup. Or you're like, I'll take this fixing land that eh, maybe I'll play, maybe I won't. And I just think that that stuff just doesn't matter. Yeah, all so the shines I'll off just, of it at that point. I just don't do yeah, it. Yeah, I think that's a great yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. And like you're hinting at, this does take a long time. You can do a rotisserie draft in paper, in person, and it takes a couple of hours. Uh, we did it virtually through a Google Sheet, which takes, you know, a week or two often. Uh, so it is a big time commitment. So this is one of the short. faster ones, and it still took us about a week, right? A little over a week, yeah. Yeah. And then in addition mm -hmm. to actually just having the sheet where everybody is making their picks, uh, it's really important also to have some kind of communication channel. So we actually set up a, a whole Discord server just for the 10 of us to communicate. And that's honestly really the fun part of a rotisserie draft. Yeah. It's just all the 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 trash talk that's going on in the discord while we're making picks it's such a great way to get to know people better like we were drafting with some people we had maybe played with in passing at kubecon or maybe we're friends with online in some places but it's just really fun to get to talk about a draft a thing you're actually doing in this shared hobby this thing we all love with people and you know have it be a thing to i always say that like it's a, something I look forward to in the morning when it's going on, right? Like during that week, it's, it's exciting to get up and be like, oh, what happened after I went to bed last night? Like it's what, like Christmas what every picks morning. What got made? Yeah. It's, uh, it's just, it's, that's really a big part of the fun of the, uh, the asynchronous rotisserie draft, I think, is that, that full week of just this an entertaining thing happening in the background. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, just the, the thrill of wait, especially when you have someone near you in the pick order that's like kind of in like a portion of your colors or like a, maybe like poking into something that you're doing as well. Like the thrill of like waiting until they pick to see if they're going to pick the card that oh, you're yeah. going to pick. And it happens, it happens way more than people would think. I mean, it, it is a, a feature <laughs> well, of it, right? Because everybody else is trying to make that calculation. Oh, yeah. Everybody wants to take, everybody wants to wait as long as possible for every pick, which it's means a often week it is. week-long game of chicken. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I uh, you know for yeah, those of us that have desk jobs, I just had a lot of days where I was like literally watching the like little <laughs> glowing Google spreadsheet cell, knowing that someone was typing in it and just waiting for them to hit enter and see what appeared. So, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely very thrilling. I think it's a, a big part of the pool of a rotisserie draft. 
I want to talk through our individual decks and records. We've talked about the regular cube a lot on this podcast, so I think listeners maybe know that environment or are more likely to know that environment than a lot of other environments we might talk about. Yeah, we did an episode prior to KubeCon, sort of an introduction to how to play it, so that might be a good one to go back to if you do want that deeper context and sort of what the goals and how you would approach playing this cube. Yeah, and the cube obviously has changed a little bit since then, but I don't think dramatically enough that that episode of that little primer is not worth it anymore. Anthony, I want to start with you. You're the cube designer. How did your draft go? How did you get into the lane you got into? Were you happy with your deck, et cetera, et cetera? So I had a couple first picks in mind, and all the first picks I was looking at were really all about trying to stake out a claim in a particular lane, really taking one of the best payoffs or something so that, like we're talking about this big game of chicken, I can kind of delay getting a lot of the enablers that are really, really critical to making the deck work because other people know that the best payoffs are already gone. And you were seat five of ten, so I was smack in the ten, middle. I mean, there much two in the people middle. in the middle, basically, of the, uh, of the actual snake, so... You had four people picking before you that were going to inform maybe what your first pick was going to be. Right. The thing I was probably most excited about as a first pick was Feather the Redeemed, but that was taken by Zach two picks earlier. And the next on my list was Traxos, Scourge of Krug. This is just a big, really hard to, to deal with creature. It's just one of the kind of most powerful things you can do in this environment. And I, I, I felt good about that first pick. It wound back to me. No one else had taken any artifact cards, which I felt pretty good about. So I decided to sort of go even more into sort of staking my claim, figuring out what my lane is going to be, or I guess broadcasting what my lane is going to be, and took Baleful Strix, which is blue-black card, but it is an artifact. It's just one of the more powerful cards in the cube. And I was really hoping just to, to really say... I'm in this blue-black artifact deck, stay away. And then third pick, I took Maze Mind Tome, which is not something I would normally pick probably this highly, but it's something that is one of the more generic enablers that I think would be really good in my deck, but it's also something people are also interested in, like it's not just an artifact card. So I really wanted to try and round that out and continue taking the cards that I thought m other people would value as much as possible and balancing that with things that were uh, at the same time sort of like more narrow. When I saw you take Traxos, pack one, pick one, or knew pick that, one. You knew that Baleful Strix was well, going to be next. I, I was like, I was like, how soon is he going to take Baleful Strix? Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's going to be second or third or fourth. Like, I know it's going to be really high up there because Baleful Strix is a very good card in your cube, obviously. I think maybe you're a little higher on it just because Baleful Strix, like, it kind of scales with the environment. Like, Baleful Strix is still extremely good in the most powerful mm -hmm. of cubes, right? right? Because if your opponent cheated some giant thing into play, unless it's indestructible, Baleful Strix can trade with it, right? Like, it's... it works at a lot of power levels. So I was curious how you were going to take it, because it was another card I was also looking at, but it, transparently... The, so I was right. <laughs> what, what, transparently, the way that this works, right, is I had a lot of cards that I was like, well, I would like to have that card, but I know for a fact that Anthony's going to take it higher than me, so I'm almost certainly not going to get it. And that's the evaluation I made about Baleful Strix. Fair enough. Uh, and then from there, I just took some a couple fixing lands, a couple black removal spells, because those were clearly getting snapped up left and right. And even though I was not planning on playing a ton of black and blue cards, I mostly wanted to play artifacts. I did want to make sure I had a couple interactive spells and uh, went from there. Finally started taking some of the more sort of enabler cards, things like Chromatic Star and Metallic Mimic, and managed to wait a good long while before picking up some of the other payoffs like Steel Overseer and Psy Master Thopterist. I think it was a big turning point for you. I remember this moment in pick 12 or yeah, pack 12 or row 12, whatever you want to call it, when Parker took Aether Spellbomb. That was so rude and unexpected. I mean, talk about that like Christmas morning feeling of opening up and seeing what's changed. <sighs> yeah. This is the other side. You know, I think I was running an errand and got back and was like, all right, let's see if any picks had been made. And Aether Spellbomb and Perilous Mirror had just been taken. Like literally on my way home, I was thinking like, oh yeah, maybe maybe it's about time to pick up Perilous Mirror and Aether mm -hmm. Spellbomb. Uh, so that was a little rough to see, but that's that's part of the game. Yeah, that also indicated, I think, that Parker was moving in on your strategy a little bit. We see his next picks here were Mirror Sire, Archaeo Mender, later on took a Chrome Courier. So he ended up also doing some Artifact Matters stuff in one similar color to your deck. And it's, oh, actually, too, he was actually also playing a little bit of black. He was kind of Esper. It's funny because I think the, the genesis of this uh, was that David, in pick four, took Reflector Mage, which is something that Parker really wanted. He had the Soul Herder, correct? Yeah, he yeah. took that pick three. So he really wanted the, the Reflector Mage to with the Soul Herder, but with that being gone, he thought, okay, I'll just try and build my own Reflector Mage with Aether Spellbomb and Archaeo Mender. So it's sort of this cascading effect of people trying to adapt their strategies and figure out how to make things work, counter to what other people were doing and taking out of the pool. So I'm curious to know, you end up going 2-7. Not great, Not but the greatest I, think that, record. I think that speaks as much to the quality of the pilot as the deck. I mean, sure, that is something we should acknowledge, right? Like, we were playing with some very good players, some former pro players, some other extreme competitive grinders, and... We've said on the show before, Anthony and I are not that for a, a bunch of reasons. 
do you think it reflects on the viability of this artifact matters deck in this cube? So here's what I would say is I think that this actually just played out so differently in a rotisserie draft than it did in a normal draft. I feel like if I had drafted this, obviously I think rotisserie drafts are going to be lead to more powerful decks because of all the things we talked about earlier. But I think that even if I had, you know, a couple of these payoffs, often just Atraxos with a, a couple other artifacts can just end games very quickly in a normal draft. But here, everyone knew exactly what I was doing and had exactly the game plan, exactly the sideboard plan, and knew it was coming, so they knew to prepare for it. And I feel like that just made a huge, huge uh, impact on how this deck played, and specifically it being a deck that is really focused on trying to do like this one thing. You know, I really need my Steel Overseer or my Traxos or Psy in play. Psy is the big one for me, I think. I feel like Psy. Feels to me like your best payoff. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, Traxos at least is just, if it gets removed after hitting twice, then you're just back to trying to kill them with like little dinky tokens or whatever. Whereas if Psy sits in play for a couple turns, it can generate enough value to, I think, snowball a bit. True. So I think that posed a really interesting challenge that I did have like a couple payoffs. And if, if people had the right interactive spells at the right time, they could really make my deck not function that well, which I think is very different from, for example, Justin's deck, where a lot of the pieces just all work together. They were all powerful threats in their own. So it didn't, I don't think, suffer from that same thing of, of being an easy deck to play against. We'll get to Justin's deck and whether or not it did or did not suffer at the end here. I do think that maybe the artifact deck, and specifically Traxos, I think maybe your and my opinions of it are a little inflated from where it actually plays these days because it's, it's been in the cube for a long time. I mean, since the earliest iterations, basically, like it's been there. I think since it was, since I think since since it was beginning, printed, yeah. basically, yeah. So I, I think it had a period of time where maybe this deck was a little better, and then the rest of the cube has kind of shifted and changed, and maybe the removal has gotten a little more dense or whatever. I think another mm. big factor is just the environment's gotten faster. There are more powerful things you can do earlier in the game in a lot of decks. Yeah. Well, I think there's a, I mean, there's a second axis on for Traxos for me. Uh, the reason I did not have this in contention of a card that I was like considering even drafting is because, you know, this is a rotisserie draft. Every removal spell that can remove Traxos is going to be right. Picked, yeah. Like all of them. So you are putting a lot of weight into having that be your in game card where a lot of other people's like best cards are a, a little more dynamic in what they're able to do. Traxos needs to not only be cast, but also have a somewhat recurring cast of, of historic cards to untap it, to be able to attack. And I feel like that's a lot to ask for, for your first pick to carry your deck when you could do that, you could play it and then play something else. And then you could, it could be met very easily with, one of many, many, many removal spells where it's not, what is it, the, uh, you know, a Moldrift reverse Baneslayer argument. And Traxos is like a Baneslayer with extra steps. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's, it's a, a Baneslayer Bane plus way. plus, yeah. <laughs> it's a Baneslayer that requires yeah, you to untap and that, it, yeah. And, and that, but that's not a small thing, though. Not only do you have to untap it, but it comes into play tapped. And you had talked about how, how you know, in... It, the cube has gotten more aggressive. That means your best card, your best attacker, is your worst blocker. Well, I would argue it. It basically a, has vigilance. It, I think in your deck, it is pretty easy to untap. Did it? Uh, but how did it, did it did it play out the way Justin's describing? Did you have Traxos removed a lot? I yeah, I did, and I, I did have Macab Waltz and Mirror Retriever, and I was hoping to also have Archaeo Mender and Blood for Bones is kind of my radar as well because I did kind of expect that counterplay and I needed ways to have redundancy against removal. But yeah, I mean, it just it put a lot of I think that's exactly the right way to put it. It just put a lot of pressure on this one card that was very easy to interact with. I think the other challenge for me is that even though I was trying to send a clear signpost, the cards that I wanted were still things that were technically playable in other people's decks. So some of the right. more incidental things like Renegade Map, which I thought was just sort of a freebie I'd get at the end of the draft. I thought for sure you'd get that for free, to be uh, honest. That got snapped up, and there were a couple other artifact picks here or there as well that uh, definitely just took some of the power, where it's like, if I had a Perilous Mirror instead of some other more interchangeable artifact here or there, I think that would make my deck a lot more impactful. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, a byproduct of your cube design philosophy, which is that you don't have a lot of really committal on-rails cards, right? Like, even the cards that are in this build-around deck for this artifact historic theme, they're just going to be playable in other decks in a lot of cases. Right, they, they might be, you know, C-minuses in, in another deck, but they're not Fs. Yeah, exactly. So, like, aside from, like, Steel Overseer, maybe, like, that's the only card I can imagine nobody wanting. Maybe Psy. Like, those are the cards I can picture that, like, yeah, probably nobody's going to take those from you unless they're explicitly hate-drafting. 
everything else, all these other pieces, all the other spell bombs of the world, yeah, you got to fight for those. Right. Yeah, and you are, you, you're putting yourself in a position where you're fighting with everyone for those colorless cards. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, just by the nature of the draft, and unlike a traditional draft where you can kind of secretly draft this deck, this is all out in the open, so it's not like you're not going to sneak up on anyone with your draft picks or with your overall strategy for Absolutely. your deck. Absolutely. So I ended up going 2-7, and you had asked me, Justin, at the beginning of the draft how I thought I would go. I think I said I'd go 3-6, so I was I was pretty accurate in my assessment. So at least I'll call that a win, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. more impressive, I think, than being good at magic. <laughs> knowing how knowing good, exactly knowing how how bad good you are, are magic is, uh, you <laughs> yeah. know, if you're a gambling man, that, that's all you need to know is exactly how good you are. Yeah, you set the line right, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. I'll go next. So I had the 10th seat in the rotisserie draft, the very last seat which I really like having the last seed. I'm not, I don't think it's necessarily better or worse. Every time one of these drafts happens, there's always a prolonged conversation about what's better, being on the ends or being in the middle. I think it's kind of a toss up, but being on the ends is definitely way better from a pragmatic standpoint because I essentially had to make half as many picks in terms of my schedule and like finding time to pick because I picked two at a time every time I picked. So uh, I just had to be at my computer less and didn't have to worry about things. But once I made two picks, then there was 18 more picks made before it got back to me again. So a lot can change in those 18 picks, obviously, about what's going on. Given that I was seat 10, there was also going to be nine people that got to pick before me. And I had in mind a couple of power outliers. I was like, these are the cards I think are better than fixing, better than like the most generic cards in the cube. And I was kind of just resigned to taking whatever was left because I figured that a lot of things would go, right? Like I did have cards like Feather. I did have cards like Lingering Souls. Plague Engineer and Bloodbraid Elf, all those cards are on my list of like, these are substantial power outliers that I'd be interested in playing. All those were gone by the time it got to me. So I ended up taking uh, one, two, Arc Lightning and Maul Drifter. And I say one, two, the order doesn't matter because there was nothing in between them. So I could have taken them in the opposite order. Arc Lightning is a removal spell that I think is just kind of disgusting here. You, you intentionally, I think, make card advantage something you have to work for, right? You don't have to give, give decks free card draw. There's not a lot of easy two-for-ones. And so Arc Lightning being a sometimes three-for-one or a pretty easy two-for-one is pretty unique. And then Muldrifter for the same reason, right? The fact that here's a way you can draw two cards and get a body into play that's a three-for-one. That is a thing that just does not come easily in this environment. So I took those without really much of an idea of, other than hopefully I'll get to play both these cards. They're both very splashable, in my opinion, because they're both a single pip of their respective costs. And you're happy to play both of them in the late game, right? You're happy to play your Arc Lightning well past turn three because it's a good removal spell, and Mold Drifter you can play on five, which is a late game anyway. So I took what I thought were two power outlier and splashable cards, and then after that, I just kind of watched how the draft... Well, So I did take Young Pyromancer pick three, because it went all the way back around and got back to me. And that was, I think, the biggest power outlier that remained that nobody had claimed. So I did snap up that young power mancer. But yeah. then after that, I just kind of sat back and took Prismatic Vistas for three picks in a row. What do you think about the Prismatic Vista run in this cube, Anthony? I feel like oftentimes in a cube with fetches and shocks or fetches and dual lands, there is a like conscious run on the lands at some point where like everybody's not taking them but everyone knows everyone's going to want them at some point and there's like so much overlap in like who can have which fetch lands and if people are playing multiple colors who can have which dual lands that you know you're fighting with everybody essentially for those picks that once one goes everyone's like all right i guess it's time to get the lands that didn't really happen here we had a player take a prismatic vista in pick one and then the very last prismatic vista went where was it Anthony with pick, pick six. six. So yeah, it was spread out over the over six different rounds of picks where the prismatic vistas went, which I didn't know what to expect, but I just took three of them in a row thinking, well, whatever I end up doing, I am going to want to have my mana work. So I'll just do this and see what happens from there. Yeah, I think that the lands is something where we've seen in the past the the chicken game really, really plays out where everybody sort of doesn't want to take their fixing yet. They want to be staking out their their sort of lanes, but then once one of them goes, it, it's spooky. It's like, oh no, if I don't take my fixing this this round, I'm gonna be just playing a bunch of basics. So we do often see this huge run. I don't have a good explanation for why that didn't happen as much this this time. They were a little bit more spread out. It could have been just some of those early picks. People had taken some lands right away, which maybe just set a different tone. Or maybe everybody was just really focused on the game of chicken and trying to next level each other. So people were a little bit more taking some fixing while also trying to balance other effects mixed in. I think it's a couple of factors. I think the fact that there's only eight prismatic vistas means that I think some players, and Justin, I think this is you, maybe you can confirm it or deny, just approached the draft and said, I'm not going to prioritize that. I'm not going to get any, right? And just like assumed that people are going to take them more highly than I am. I'm not even going to try. I'm not fighting for them at all. And the other factor is that because you don't have the 
fetch shock or fetch dual mana base, that means that Justin ended up playing a red green deck and pretty much could just get every red green dual land, right? Because right, yeah. nobody was going to take, you know, a stomping ground to like get off of their fetch land to like half fix for another color. Because if you're not playing red and green, you're not interested in red green lands, which means that those are a little bit safer to get later on, which is not the case with duels and fetches. Yeah, it's a great point. I think it's a combination of some of those things. I think this cube, in in my opinion, and you guys are drafting it way more than me, but this was my well, take not as well that. as you though. So this you was know. not a <laughs> this was not a cube that I felt like a three color deck was viable in a a normal sense. And what what I mean by that is you would have to do some hoop jumping in your draft picks to justify having a three color deck. Doesn't mean it's not playable, but you are just choosing to do so. And when I say you, I just mean the general you. A person would be choosing to just play three colors because they wanted to, not because it was the optimal thing to do to win. Yeah. The fixing is, it's not It's not bad. So I don't want to, I'm trying to, I was going to say the fixing is bad, but that's not the case. The fixing is I mean, not bad. You can bad. definitely say it is, fixing, it is less powerful than in a lot of cubes that gets played, what, played a lot. The fixing is, is less powerful across the board. Some colors, some color combinations have better fixing than others, just straight away. So, like, for example, like, I, the, I played a red-green deck. Stomping Ground is one of three shock lands in the queue. Yeah. That's just a more, a more powerful fixing card than a, a, a non temple or whatever. Land. I mean, yeah. pretty much just straight a temple. Yeah, exactly. So there was an inequality for some of those color combinations. And because of that, Prismatic Vista is only fixing, like, two colors. Basically, I'm looking at it. I'm saying, well, I'm only going to be two colors. So Prismatic Vista is just... It's just fixing, it's it's fixing, it's getting a basic land for one of my two colors. I'm not getting like a third splash color or anything. So that wasn't something that I felt like I needed to do. And there's not as many payoffs for shuffling in this cube on top of that. There is Brainstorm, which in a rotisserie draft is significantly better than... It, it's, it's one of those cards that I think goes much, much higher up my pick list in a rotisserie draft because you have full agency over the amount of shuffle effects you're going to be able to see. But outside of that... There's not a ton of cards that benefit from like filling up the graveyard. There's not a ton of cards that benefit from shuffling your deck. So those cards, the Prismatic Vistas went much lower on my pick list to the point where I saw Dan pick on pick one in with his first pick in the his he had the second pick overall, his first round. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna right. this. Yeah. Like I'm just gonna go and stick with my two color I- ideology and go with that. And I think that a number of other people had that same idea in the draft based on how it went. Like I'm, I know for sure that both Zach and Ryan had the exact same thought process as I did. When it came yeah. To so we weren't, it weren't, it wasn't even on our radar to pick that. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, a, a registry draft is very different from a normal round table, traditional draft in that I think in a lot of cases, some things work in rotisserie in a given cube that just don't work in a round table and vice versa. Three color mm-hmm. decks have been, I think, perfectly viable and put up decent numbers in this cube historically. But like you said, Justin, like here we're drafting like the best version of every deck. And the question is, is the best version of a three color deck as good as the best version of a, of a two color deck? And it might be that the equity you get in a regular draft of splashing a third color is that you get like a little higher card quality because you're taking from three colors instead of two. And here, if everybody gets their pick of whatever they want from the entire pool that advantage is not that great anymore. And instead, now you're just making your mana base a little worse for a very little gain. I felt in this draft more than ever before. So I had three Prismatic Vistas. I ended up with a lot of other lands. I I was playing three colors. I was almost entirely blue-red. I did splash black for just Creeping Tar Pit and the Spectacle Cost on Rick's Maddie Reveler, which I took Creeping Tar Pit and Rick's Maddie Reveler in picks seven and eight in a, uh, a heel turn, becoming the like seventh player to go into black to some degree and uh, leaving people shocked and awed because I rate Rick's Maddie Reveler really, really highly in this environment. It's, I, I mean, we talked about how hard it is to just get a two for one, and this is if you can empty your hand, which I aim to have a lot of cheap removal spells and cheap threats, it just turns into a four for one if you can just draw three cards with that thing when you spectacle it. So that's why I ended up playing a little bit of black. And what I felt in this draft more than ever before is how much worse a Prismatic Vist is at fixing for a three-color deck than a regular fetch land. Because I laid out my mana base, right? And I said, okay, Prismatic Vista is a source of all three colors. It's a red source, a blue source, and a black source. And it is, but it's only one of those in any given game. So if you're laying out your mana base and saying, all right, I've got my 
10 blue sources and my, you know, 11 red sources and my eight black sources, right, for my for my splash. Those numbers sound good, right? That's like a decent mana base in a uh, limited environment like this with a 40 card deck. But there were so many times where it's like, well, I did draw a quote unquote black sources game or a quote unquote, or my second red, I needed to double spell and have two red mana. But I had to get an island with it because it was also my blue source that I needed to go get that island with the Prismatic Vista. And I did stumble on mana more than I expected to just because I think of how much I underestimated mm -hmm. just how much worse Prismatic Vistas were in this context because I've never had this many in, in a regular. Like, when you draft normally, I just get, like, one or two, and I'm happy to have them. Here, I, like, prioritize three very highly. I did take effects like Brainstorm and things like Grim Lava Mancer that would get advantage from using cards like this pretty highly as well. So I was kind of in that space. But having that many Prismatic Vistas and, and also playing nine matches with one deck, which you never do in a regular draft really made me feel like, okay, this is much worse than I expected it to be in terms of actually fixing it for three colors worth of mana. Yeah, this was also a space where I saw a really big difference between the way this environment plays in a rotisserie draft versus a normal booster draft, where if I'm thinking about what's a good first pick, I love starting with Prismatic Vistas early because you get to stay open and it's fixing that's always going to work no matter what you draft. But here, I think like you're saying, Justin, that fixing didn't matter for you. It wasn't better fixing for you than any of the other dual lands that you weren't fighting anybody for, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and that's why, you know, for me, when when I was looking at the top of the draft of identifying what, you know, what I was preparing to, I had the eighth pick, preparing for myself to get, there was not a time where fixing was on my radar. Just yeah. at all. Because it wasn't you're, in the top five or whatever. You're giving, a, no, I mean, it wasn't in the top 20, really. Uh, you're you're giving up too much equity for a meaningful card by by doing that. Because there is, in every single cube, there is a upper crust of cards that are going to go in the first two rounds. That is just that is just how magic works. Some cards are better than others. And with something like Prismatic Vista, there's so many, you're going to have a chance to draft Prismatic Vistas later. And general fixing later. Not just Vista, but general fixing later. And I just think that you cannot give up the opportunity to draft those premium cards that are the highest impact cards for your deck and like you said, over nine games like that, you really need to have that anchor card or cards to be able to have your deck function. And I think that fixing is very important, but it's at that point in the draft, it's just not. It's for me, as, as, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's not, it's not important until a little bit later. I have a theory, Justin. I'm curious if you agree. I have a theory that in any cube you could possibly design, no matter what, there is always going to be some chunk of the cube, call it 3%, 5%, 10%. That is mm -hmm. always better than the best fixing. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, I, and I 100% agree. Yeah, I think like even if you put, you know, uh, fetches that's and how duels, magic works. Fetches and duels in your like, you know, low power pauper cube, right? Still, mm -hmm. the best low power pauper cards are going to be a much higher pick than any fixing because the very nature of them being the best cards in the cube means that having them in your deck is that much better than just hedging against having more, you know, Bs and B pluses of a given color pair in your deck. I mean, I, I, however you shake it out in a in a pauper cube, Denrova Horror is better than Underground Sea. Okay, yeah, like, that's true. Underground Underground Sea is a better Magic card contextually, but in each environment there are going to be those cards, and fixing is always going to come below that. Even the best fixing is always going to come below. Yeah. So I ended up in a like very low to the ground blue red aggressive deck, and I didn't really commit to the aggressive side for a little while. I was kind of hedging around and seeing where other players playing my colors ended up landing in terms of the speed and kind of cards they were prioritizing. But I ended up with a deck that if you don't count Fiery Temper and Frantic Search as three mana cards, but instead count them as zero and one mana cards, I had nothing over two mana in my entire deck, uh, main deck. And I didn't main deck Maul Drifter as previously mentioned because I was really low to the ground, so I didn't really want a five drop. And I didn't want a three drop that didn't proc any of my spells matter stuff. It didn't trigger my Pyromancer. It didn't trigger my Electrostatic Infantry or my Sprite Dragon. didn't trigger any of that stuff. I love drafting this kind of deck. I think I said in our little like interview we did for your YouTube channel, Justin, that there's something about uh, just playing little dinky cards and trying to win not yeah. off the back of individual card power. Like, all my cards cost two mana. None of them individually are very powerful, right? It's just... I, I said Arc Landing. I totally lied. I had Arc Landing. It's my three mana card. But... None of my cards individually were like 
raw power level, right? They're all just dinky little cards. I was trying to combine them in this sort of tempo deck to kind of get an advantage. And I don't know why I have such a, a pull to doing that and like essentially making myself the underdog from the moment the game starts where it's like, well, if they get to cast a four drop, none of my cards are that good. So I have to like, you know, have a plan for when that inevitably happens. I mean, that's just the kind of, that's the kind of win that you enjoy. You love, love for the end game to be a little puzzle. You want to squeeze it out. out. How do I get exactly lethal on this turn? For and I you, did have a lot of fun. I mean, I was thinking about like, hey, look, no matter how I do in this draft, like I better enjoy the deck I'm playing because I'm playing nine rounds. Yeah, it, right? that's a great so point. So if I if that's a that's a big deal, right? That's and, a real big deal because I've drafted a deck I did not like, even the, the, regardless of how good it was. And man, that is just it's a mis- miserable existence. I have to play through a whole rotisserie with a deck you don't like. Yeah. So uh, I was leaning on Rick's Matty Reveler for card advantage, along with Bomac Courier. Those are kind of my two anchors in terms of like, I've got a bunch of cheap removal, I've got a bunch of cheap threats, my goal is to empty my hand and then use one of these to refill. And that plan worked really successfully. I was just as impressed with Rick's Matty Reveler in this environment as I was going in. A card is really, really good. So uh, that, I think, was worth the high pick and I think worth the splash, though I did suffer. I mean, really, here's the cost of the Prismatic Fist of Mana Base. I never wanted a swamp. I never wanted to draw my swamp. I had dual lands in, that were red, black, and blue, black, and I was happy to draw those because they're still producing one of my main colors of mana, but I had to have a swamp in my deck for those three prismatic vistas to count as a black source, and that swamp was just, every time I saw it, I was cursing the heavens because I did not want to draw that card, and uh, it did mess me up. I couldn't double spell in so many turns where I wanted to double spell. It was not like I was mana screwed, like, oh, I can't cast my spells. It was like, oh, I can't actually Just curve mana squish yeah i can't actually curve electrostatic <laughs> infantry into volt charge or whatever this turn because i don't have double red or whatever that was what i ended up getting squeezed on i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you a crazy question did you need a swamp um see here's the thing <laughs> did like did you really or do you just like <laughs> like from a a high level i have cards that need black mana to op uh, to operate but you only needed black mana to operate those cards at their highest level they still function yes, without it they still function so did without you need it. did you need a swamp did it hurt you more than it would have helped you because i i wouldn't have played a swamp in your deck at the end of the day it may have hurt me more than it helped me so if i didn't play a swamp i had three black sources for i think am i counting correctly mm-hmm. so anyway I, I yeah i think that you have enough you have enough filtering in your deck like you have you have consider reman opt frantic search uh, Fading Hope Scries, you have Mold Drifter, which you didn't play, you have uh, Brainstorm. Like, you have a lot of ways, Electrolyze, you have a lot of ways to, like, look through cards. I wouldn't play Swap. Yeah, I mean, maybe me in hindsight I shouldn't have. I did really like having my Black Mana when I wanted to Spectacle my Rick's Maddie Reveler, and that felt important when it happened. But, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to measure that against all the turns where I couldn't double spell exactly the way I wanted to, or couldn't, you know, play my threat and also hold up remand because I didn't have double blue or whatever, uh, which is which was the sort of one, I think, functional failing of my deck. Because I, I, there were many times where, like, in a deck like this, sequencing is so important, right? If you're going to play these little dinky tempo cards and try and beat people that are playing Traxos or Bloodbraid Elf or, you know, whatever, it's, uh, these giant expensive cards, you have to be able to actually play your tempo cards in exactly the order and time you want to play them. And the tap lands also hurt a little bit in this regard. Like, I'm used to playing this deck a lot in a cube like mine, where there essentially are no tap lands if you avoid the couple that are floating around. And there was also a couple of times where it's like, well, here's my land, but it's tap, so I can't, you know, do these two things in this one turn, and that was a big cost. I did end up going 4-5, which I think I, you know, said I'd be very happy if I went 5-4 when I talked to you, Justin, so, you know... Similar, again, spot there. All of my matches, save for two, felt very winnable. And I had very, very close games in a lot of my losses. So I felt pretty good overall about the deck. My matchup against David, who was playing like a blue-white control deck, felt awful. It felt like I was never going to win. We only played two games because I got absolutely smoked. But uh, it felt like I had absolutely no chance there. He has so much removal. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I have like nine threats in my deck, I think. Something like that. And it was just that he just removed all my threats in both games. And I was like, okay, well, I electrolyze you. Ha ha. <laughs> you know, like yes. it was it was a mess. Something else that I've, I heard from a couple people that was really tough about that matchup was all of his removal was exile based. It was oblivion yes. ranks and things like that. And I had a couple ways to recur things from the graveyard, but it just meant that my whole plan B was kind of out the window against that kind of removal. The other matchup that felt really bad for me was up against Gwen, who was playing like a green, black, the rock mid rangey deck. And there was a combination of Gwen actually had even more removal than David by the numbers, not quite the quality of removal. But if you just count, Mm -hmm. I like made a little matrix of how many removal spells my opponents have. And Gwen had the most that killed all my stuff. 
So uh, a lot of removal spells and also just a lot of like four toughness threats and all my removal is burn based. So uh, the combination of those two things also made that matchup feel unwinnable. But one of my wins was against Ryan who ended up winning the entire thing. So I felt pretty good about that. And like I said, the other matches I played were very close and where I lost it was like, you know, small edges. Like there's one game where I drew a couple cards to like try and end the game in an explosive fashion didn't quite get there, and then, like, the next card on top of my deck was a Lava Dart, which would have actually gotten the win. So it's, like, lots of little tiny close mm. games, which is the kind of magic I do really like. So overall, I do think that this kind of deck is definitely viable here. I don't think this deck is ever going to go 9-0 in this, in this cube in a rotisserie draft. I don't think it's possible to draft this kind of deck in a way that it has favorable matchups across the board because there are so many decks that just have a lot of removal, and then you're just kind of stuffed out. I think it's going to be difficult for, in, in this cube, um, this is going to be almost impossible for any deck to go nine. Just Speaking the, of that, the, let's get to you, Justin, because uh, I think after the <laughs> draft, Anthony and I agreed that you had the scariest, best-looking deck from from early on, honestly. You like very prominently staked out your territory in red-green. You got all the red-green cards you could ever possibly want, and uh, I was predicting you would win. Talk about your deck and uh, how you ended up drafting it. Yeah, so well, first I want to start with Ryan did win because Ryan beat me. And he won the heads-up tiebreaker. Yep, you had the same I, record. You I, both went 7-2. I will note that I had a better game-win record than Ryan. Okay. <laughs> okay. Somebody's right. been right. deep in the numbers. We should have been more thorough about what the tiebreakers are beforehand. <laughs> I mean, heads-up is the tiebreaker. There's, there should never be okay. a time okay. where if Ryan and I had the same record and he beat me, that I should win. Yeah, that like, that's just sense. That's absolute nonsense. Yeah, I went 16-4. and four. I lost four games, two to Ryan and two to Zach. And that then, is pretty wild uh, that you only lost games to the two matches you lost. That's yep. That's nuts. Yes. Uh, and then 16. So I even got a game off of Ryan and Zach. Those went to three. So I went 16 and four. Ryan went 15 and seven. So almost twice as many losses as me. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> uh, I think we are having no, Ryan, Ryan on the show next week. So if you want to like, you oh, know, fire good. some shots across the bow <laughs> and just, uh, you I, know. There's no, I mean, there's no shots. He beat me. Heads Do up, a little trash talking. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's the tail of the tape right there. Heads up. He, he won and that makes him the winner of the draft. I am, uh, I will be okay with second place considering that I, I felt pretty good about both my preparation, my draft and my play on the weekend. So I can hang my hat on that. All right. So for this cube, and for any cube that I rotisserie draft, I approach it with a single question first. The question of that is, is this a cube where there are combos in the cube? And a combo could mean something as deep as like Storm with Mind's Desire, or it could mean Splinter Twin and Pester Might. It could mean, you know, something lower level. And basically, in a rotisserie draft, combos of of two or more cards are really, really critical because all of the cards are available. This is obviously unlike a regular booster draft. Those cards are always going to be 100% available to draft, and you have to be mindful of that. The regular cube, I felt like, was a cube that did not really have any combos. The, other, the only combo that I, de- that I identified as like a combo, and I'm really putting air quotes around that, is Oketra's Monument plus the couple creatures that went with Oketra's Monument. The I think white everything main else cards that just say yeah, white main line token cloaker. for one mana as many as you want at instant speed. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely the, exactly. the closest, and it is pretty committal, and it doesn't go infinite. It just generates a lot of value pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, and a combo you know doesn't have to be infinite, but just like a you know something that is a like a closed loop that is very advantageous for the person that is doing. I think there are a couple so, more things on that level for me in this cube. Like, I think Reckless Rage and Feather is, like, right there. I mean, just yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. twice yeah. a turn cycle being able to, you know, flame slash something at instant speed is pretty nuts. I also think Dreadheart Arcanist combines with a ton of the, like, fight spells. We've joked about how in this cube, Dreadheart Arcanist is better than it is in my cube because you're actually playing ways to, you know, like, cast Domri's Ambush and then, you know, attack mm-hmm. and cast Domri's Ambush again. Now you have a giant Dreadheart Arcanist, so... Some of the Dreadheart yeah, Arcanist lines, too, I think are equally potentially scary, but I mean, overall, I agree. I think that this is not the entire environment where you're looking at specific card interactions. Yeah. You're looking for more of an overall strategy. Exactly. Uh, Dreadheart Arcanist, I think, is wide enough. Like, you play that with any color. It's just a good card. Yeah. It's a, just an insane card. That's why you it's banned in Legacy. Card good. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. Uh, Feather and Reckless Edge, I'll agree with. I, 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 I didn't think about that one because I knew, I went, so I had the eighth pick. 
Uh, I knew I was not going to get Feather. I knew there was absolutely zero chance that on the eighth pick that Feather was available. So I didn't even have that as like a potential pick. Lingering Souls and Feather were the two cards I was like, these are not going to make it to me. Yeah. And they didn't. There was a third card that I also thought was not going to make it to me that did, and I didn't pick it, that I had uh, ranked higher than Bloodbraid Elf. So Bloodbraid Elf was my first overall pick, and I'll get into my my draft in a second. But uh, Blood Artist was actually a card that I had ranked higher than Bloodbraid Elf. However, Interesting. there were so many people already in black. Yeah, I just felt that the the ceiling on Blood Artist was just like really, really, really high. Like it's really heavily supported in black. It's really heavily supported in red. I thought there was a lot of there was a lot of like tangential support in white. So there was a lot of ways to make a really powerful Blood Artist deck. And it's a card that is just has a very high ceiling and a high floor. And that brings me to kind of my overall thought about the cube is this is not, like I said, a cube that is a combo oriented cube for a rotisserie draft. That doesn't mean that, you know, if, if something is, that doesn't mean it's a, a combo cube, but just that there are a lot of two or more card combos. So since this wasn't one of those cubes, my goal for drafting cubes like this, rotisserie drafting cubes like this, is to draft a deck that has a very high floor. So my process was to identify cards that had high floors and then build around having a high a floor as possible, which is ultimately what led me to drafting this red-green, fairly aggressive deck. And I do think that of all 10 drafters, I had the highest floor of every single deck. Yeah, I think your I deck I didn't have, was pretty cracked. I yeah, I don't think I had the highest ceiling. I think Zach had the highest ceiling. Zach taking taking feather first overall and had a very a very good feather deck. And if he has feather, I uh, felt like that was going to be very difficult for him to lose those games based on just that card. But yeah, I, based on the rest of the, the rest of my draft, I do I do feel like my my ceiling was relatively high because of my curve. But I also, again, felt like I had the highest floor by a decent amount, which was just going to lead me to wins just by simply casting my card, any like any card in my deck when I had it, when I had the mana for it. And that sounds really simple, but look, I've been playing Magic for a really long time, and I don't get you don't get any extra points for like cleverly winning or winning. But it's fun, uh, Justin, in, in the way that Andy likes to do it. Yeah, I got to remand um, my own uh, Avacyn's Judgment and then cast Avacyn's Judgment again to get exactly enough spell is, triggers to kill Ryan, and that was very fun. <laughs> that's very clever. That's very clever. <laughs> you know what I like? I like for that. <laughs> I like playing creatures and attacking and then noting my opponent's life total at zero, and that happened a lot. So my first pick was Bloodbraid Elf. It was a card that I was like, I didn't think people were going to take kind of in the uh, first half of the draft. And it was the card I was really hoping once, once, uh, once Ryan took Plague Engineer, that's kind of what turned me off of, of Blood Artist. I was like, all right, well, we're going to do Blood Bright Elf. And I basically had like a one, two punch for each of the cards that I was considering where the second pick for Blood Bright Elf was Burning Tree Emissary, which is what I did take. The card that actually I obviously had ranked significantly higher than everyone else was Reflector Mage. I actually thought that was one of the best cards for a first round pick in the cube. And then I go till pick four. Well, I guess pick three for Dave McDarby. He was on the uh, the front end wheel. So he picked that with his first, first pick of the fourth round. But I, I guess, I don't know. I think that card is like pretty nuts in this cube because you're only winning with combat damage. Yeah. And uh, Reflector Mage is really ridiculous against decks that are trying to win with combat damage, especially if you can, like, blink it at all. It, so. It's funny, because I, I think you're totally right, right? You, when you, like, just look at it objectively, it, it is one of the better cards in the cube in a lot of ways. For all that we've played this cube, Anthony, have you ever heard anybody, like, groan about getting beaten by a Reflector Mage? Like, I just feel like only, it doesn't come up. Only if it's paired with a Soul Herder. I mean, that's definitely groan-worthy, for sure. Um, well, yeah, but but that was available. Like, someone could have just taken that. Yeah. Totally, yeah. I mean, like, McDarby could have just taken... Soul Mage, I think, is... You're talking about this, like, one-two part punch to get things started. Yeah. I think that is a really powerful way to start a draft. Yeah, big time. Soul Herder's the I top mean, of my list of cards that I think are too fragile for three mana in a cube like this, especially in a rotisserie draft, right? There is just so many ways to pick off a Soul Herder without even yeah, trying. You know, I you agree. just fungal That's infection true. it. I just have Lava Dart. Like, I, I was not at all worried about the Soul Herder that, uh, that Parker took third pick here. No, I wasn't either. I, 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 you, with Soul Herder, you have to have a, like a double digit amount of creatures that are good with Soul Herder. And then Soul Herder can be very scary because of the good creatures that you're able to recur. But 
Soul Harder, if you're like trying to cobble together like one or two creatures in your deck that's good with it, uh, whatever, that's fine. It's a, it's a one mana 3-3. Three, three. Yeah. Like, yeah, it doesn't have the same immediate impact on the board that Reflector Mage obviously does. Well, it's kind of like the Traxos thing, right? Where you have to work for it for it to be any good. Right. But also, exactly. unlike Traxos, and it's, Soul Harder and dies it's two to colors. Stiff Wind. It dies to any removal spell. <laughs> yeah, and it's two colors. Yeah, it's just I mean, that's two not, colors, that's yeah. a, that's a that's a big deal, too. But Reflector Mage, I thought was really good. That was like the... Uh, that I think I actually would have picked Reflector Mage had Bloodbraid Elf not been on the board and the draft would have looked wildly different. But Bloodbraid Elf was on the board, so I was like, all right, I'm gonna draft this Gruel deck because I identified a couple of things that I think a lot of people kind of came to the same conclusion in the draft. Is that one, black was the deepest color. That was clear, I think, for most everyone, where black was uh, almost every single black card was drafted outside of what, like two cards? There were only like two cards, two black cards left that were not drafted. It was really like a very small number. Like to, yeah. to scroll through, it's like, yeah, there's two My boy cards. reassembling skeleton, which I, I felt like that was like a, a personal affront to reassembling skeleton. <laughs> Vault Scourge, I'm not surprised to see uh, unpicked. That card gets played too much, I think. I think in normal drafts of this cube. Yeah. Yeah. Vault Scourge, I mean, it's like Vault Scourge, I could see why I didn't get picked. Like if, if you were more like deeper into the Steel Overseer stuff, then Vault Scourge would have been great. But if you're not, then right, it's yeah. kind of just hanging around. Well, I feel like Vault Scourge in this context provides that like smoothness to the draft experience where it's playable in any deck. So like yeah. it's mm-hmm. it's going to help you in a regular draft not end up with like unplayable cards and have to be like playing junk out of your sideboard or whatever. But those are the kind of cards that are just not on the radar on a rotisserie draft where everyone gets perfect information and perfect picks. Yeah, it, that, that's exactly right. It's a it's a super reasonable card, like absolutely super reasonable card. But yeah, it's um very rarely is going to line up. Like I said, I think the only way is if you are like having the Steel Overseer deck where like that's one of your best cards, then you're like looking for Vault Scourge, but no one else is, so you can just draft it later. So I drafted Burning Tree Emissary with my second pick, and I think both of you guys were like that card has underperformed, which surprised me. So I recently, I actually recently added Bloodbraid Elf, so it's cool to see it getting a lot of play right away, and it's been interesting to see how people have approached Red Green differently, and in the last, let's say, like, month or two since those changes, I've seen Burning Tree MSA perform in a totally different way, where I think people just weren't necessarily trying to draft aggressive, really proactive green-red decks where mm. it really shines, so it was too often I'd see somebody play it and be like, I, I get two mana and pass the turn, but it, that's definitely changed recently. Maybe also just with our approach to the cube and getting more experience. Yeah, I think okay. um, my perspective on Burning Tree Emissary was that I think it's not respected by our playgroup uh, and just right. not played enough because, you know, a, a free 2-2 in this environment is really, really good. You're winning with combat damage. The decks are, for the most part, pretty low to the ground. So if you get to on turn two, play this into another two drop, that's a really explosive start that almost no deck's going to be able to compete with. So I respected yeah, the high I- pick of the Burning Tree Emissary. I ended up drafting, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine other two drops to to play alongside Burning Tree Emissary. Yeah. And there was even one game that I played it on turn two, and I didn't play two drops, but the cards I played were Rabbit Battery and Ranker. And that, that actually a, felt even better than playing a two better. drop. <laughs> that's a lot better. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so that was my second pick. I'm a, hu- I'm a huge fan of Burning Tree Emissary. I think that card's absolutely nuts. And that was kind of... That was the basis, those two cards that I was drafting around. I'm like, okay, well, I want two drops to play with Burning Tree Missary, and I want things that are cost under three. That's an impact spell to play off of Bloodbraid Elf, and that kind of just led me down the rest of the draft. One thing that I that I also identified as something that was powerful was Sylvan Advocate just as a card, but also there's a significant amount of creature lands in this cube, especially in red and green. I ended up drafting four over the course of the entire draft, I had Mutavault, Mistress Factory, Treetop Village, and Raging Ravine. And I can probably say that that, that that me drafting Sylvan Advocate so highly with my fourth pick probably led to me getting additional wins because I dealt lo- final damage frequently with my creature lands, like very often. And anytime time, there, I think there were two games that I had Sylvan Advocate on turn six and had a creature land and the game just ended. Like the, the, the amount of power I was able to play for like one card was just overwhelming for pretty much any other card in the cube because the creatures are not huge. Like most of the creatures in this cube are not huge. So my creatures just ended up being bigger and costing essentially nothing compared to everyone else's. There's a combo for um, you, Justin. <laughs> Six lands, yeah. one of which is a creature land and Sylvan Advocate. 
I mean, it was. Yeah. It truly was. So I drafted the Sylvan Advocate, Advocate pretty highly. The thing about my deck is, you know, I really felt like I was able to get almost every single card that I wanted. Actually, there was only one card that the pick I was going to take it that someone else took it. And that was round 11, Dan Schneider took Bushwhack with his 11th pick, and I was going to take that. Bushwhack, I was really interested in for my deck. I really didn't want to have too many fight cards. I really wanted to have burn spells because fight spells with Bloodberry Elf can be bad sometimes. Yes. That can be very scary if you're playing into an open board, and I hate having decks where I have Bloodberry Elf into an open board. And in fact, the only card... I had two cards. Well, I guess three cards, technically. I had three cards that were bad to hit into an open board with Bloodberry Elf, which were Rancor, which was obviously excellent, uh, Blossoming Defense, and then Lava Coil. And I think the upside of those cards, obviously, I outplayed that. But Bushwhack, that's a fight card that if you just hit it off Blood Bright Elf, you're like, I get, a, I guess I get a land instead of this, and it's not a dead card. So I was really hoping to get that. I didn't. You're saying, you're saying that, that's literally the only card you would play over one of the cards in your pool? No, 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 no. No, no, no. I was going to say. That's not what I'm saying. No, there, well, it is, there's only four, actually. Um, I was looking through, there's six for me. I think there were six cards I missed out on that would have been like kind of the ideal version of the deck I wanted. Yeah, so uh, that was the only one that I was like going to draft that round. There were other cards that I had ranked slightly lower, and I was like, yeah, I just got kind of got beat to the punch, and I just need to adjust, but it wasn't like a key part of my strategy. The other ones were uh, Experiment 1, Pelt Collector, and then Rimrock Knight. And ultimately, that was... You know, I just had to lean into red a little bit more after that, which I was actually already doing. I was actually had had drafted red cards a lot higher than green cards because I felt like green seemed like it was the I don't want to say weakest color because I think that that is inappropriate. I think it, it, because it's a rotisserie draft, so weakness is irrelevant. Uh, it it was one of the shallowest colors, but because of that, I, there were not a lot of people fighting for green cards, and I pretty much got every single other green card. I got every single other green card that I wanted. All of the aggressive green cards. Yeah, I think um, the most the pick that had the biggest delta in how late it went and the raw power level was you getting a pick fifteen ranker. That felt like you really had gotten away with something there. I completely agree. I actually will take it one further. I will say the biggest MVP in my deck relative to where it was picked. Can you, I can you, I guess you, saddled you guys, rhyme stag? You, that is absolutely correct. That card is Anthony. messed up. Saddled rhyme stag. So saddled rhyme stag is a two two for one and a green, but that's not true. It's actually a four four for one and a green, and that's basically as long as it's your turn, and that's basically the only text it had in my deck. Yep. Turns out Tarmogoyf is pretty good. I drafted so many so many haste creatures that I just want. I'm playing my creatures pre combat anyway because that's what I want to be doing. So Saddle Rhyme Stag was just like on turn two, a 4-4. Four, four. It was absolutely like, it was insane. It was, uh, I, I felt dirt. I had to go back and like, when did I draft this? And I was like, man, I messed up because I drafted it so late, even though I got it. Going back, I would have drafted it higher just for its power level. Um, but it was absolutely one of the best cards in my deck. It was the it was the best two drop after Burning Tree Emissary. And I drafted it in the 18th round. I'm glad to hear you so, say that. Because I think when we recorded the primer on this cube we noted saddle rhyme stag as one of the green power outliers it's Oof, like it truly was we talked on that episode about how i think it suffers from this deal where because most people didn't draft modern horizons very much and it wasn't like a extremely discussed limited environment because it wasn't you know one of the typical ones it was more expensive it was a premier limited environment you don't have this like uh and it wasn't in standard either right you don't have this like uh, yeah, this yeah. mentality around the card, right? It doesn't have the same reputation it would have had if it was in a regular limited set. If that was in a regular limited set, it, people would still be complaining about it to this day because that card is totally messed up. It's just that most people didn't play with it because it's not modern viable, right? It's not going to get played in modern. And if it's in Modern Horizons and it's not so good that it's going to get played in internal formats, then it's so easy for people to overlook it. And uh, I think that card is really, really good, though. Yeah, I completely agree. It was, uh, it was absolutely incredible. It was absolutely incredible. You know, as I was going through my draft, what my process is, and I put a significant amount of, I don't even want to say how much time I spent preparing, like before the draft and during, but what I did essentially was I had a group of all of the cards I wanted to draft for my deck. And obviously that changes as the draft goes, but I had a list of all of the cards and I would just identify what do I think of the cards that I have? What do I think that people are going to draft? I didn't really draft what I wanted to draft based right. on my order. I drafted what everyone else I thought wanted to draft. Exactly, yeah. 
And I did that literally for the entire draft. Like, there were cards that I got late that were, for example, I drafted Domri's Ambush in pick 31 and Yavimaya Iconoclast in pick 32. I knew from pick two, those p- two cards were going to be in my main deck, and they were both excellent. They're great. Yeah, they're really high picks, but those are the cards you don't have to fight for unless somebody explicitly is going out of their way to ruin your day. Correct. And uh, and so basically, my entire pick order was exclusively based on what do I think someone else might pick. It never deviated from that. So the entire draft after pick two was what do I think someone else is going to pick? So that was that was my core tenet for the entire draft, and that is kind of how my picks came together. I think that's really... I don't want to say it's the only way to to do a rotisserie draft well because that would be arrogant and wrong, but I think that that is the way that you're going to get the best results if you're looking to win. Is just look at the people that are in your colors that could be in your colors because people jump in other colors all the time in rotisserie drafts, which is actually why I took stomping ground so highly because I was like, well, actually I think it was the first dual land taken. That I'm looking through. Might be the case. It was the first dual land taken. You took Creeping Tar Pit as the second dual land taken two picks Yeah, two picks later. So Stomping Ground, I was like, this is a perfect card for people to jump in. Sorry, hold on one sec. First pick of the whole draft, Celestial Colonnade. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, McDarby picked Celestial Colonnade first. Okay, I stand stand corrected. So, uh, but Stomping Ground, I was like, this is a really powerful land. Come to play untapped and fix his mana. There's not many cards in the whole cube that do both of those things. So I was like, this is a card that I feel like if someone wanted to poke into red or green, they would pick this first, because that's what I would do if I was going to poke into someone's color. If I was wanted to, you know, touch onto a, a third color, I would pick Stomping Ground and then pick the card I wanted to splash. So I was like, well, I got I to gotta take that to try to disincentivize people from doing that. And that was the second factor of how I picked everything was basically trying to disincentivize people from messing with my strategy. It worked. Overall, spoilers, obviously, uh, I went 7-2. and two. My deck was very, very good. My 7-2 and two was actually my prediction for my record, so I, I was able to, uh, to hit mine. Did you think you had exactly two bad matchups when you like looked at the, the matchup spread at the beginning of the I, whole event? I thought I had one bad matchup, but, which was Zach, and he did beat me. I think we could probably, we could probably play that one 10 times, and he probably beat me 8 times. He just matches up really, really well. He has a lot of first-strike creatures. Uh, that's bad. That's bad news because I'm doing a lot of attacking. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he's able to attack and he, he can just play offense and defense better than me. Now, Zach is matching up poorly against a lot of other decks, which I think was reflected in the record. I think Zach went five and four. Yeah, he went five and four. And the biggest difference was for Zach's deck, he was in the red, white feather deck. He did not want to see removal spells and sweepers. I did. I want everyone to tap out and play a sorcery speed anything on their turn. Right. Like, that's how, I, that's how I'm going to win, is I'm going to feast on you if you pl- play spells during your turn. So I didn't care about that. I had four creature lands. I had, like, seven haste creatures. Like, whatever. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you, you play this sweep two of my creatures. That's fine. That just means you don't have any blockers. I'm going to hit you. But since I'm not doing that, Zach was going to be a problem. And uh, I was like, I, I thought that there were two other matchups that I was concerned with. That being David McDarby who I obviously, yeah, I beat everyone else 2-0, uh, and Dan Schneider, who I also thought could put up a lot of defense in the form of toughness for his creatures. And that was something that, that I was going to have a hard time, have a hard time getting past. If I couldn't, if I couldn't like kind of flex my muscles in the combat step, it was going to be difficult for me to win. Yeah. Those two ended up not happening. I lost to Ryan, as we said, and I said before the game, the games against Ryan, I was like, I was like, well, there's one card that I don't that I think I'm gonna have a really tough time beating. That's Sling Gang Commander. And Sling Gang Lieutenant. Damn it, if Ron, you keep saying Sling, Sling Gang Commander. Like, I do. I think every time over I the whole weekend. Yeah, probably because of Siege Gang. Commander. Yeah, probably. Just you know, maybe they shouldn't name those cards almost identically if they want to get them confused. Uh, anyway. Giver of Runes. Buh, buh, buh. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, more Modern Horizons. Everything's a reference to something else. Sling Gang Lieutenant. And I was like, I, I'm gonna have a lot of trouble beating that. And Good news for Ryan. He played it on exactly turn four every single game that we played. I even beat Weird. it one that time, but I couldn't beat me it the too. other two. <laughs> yeah. Shuffler bug. Um, so I did lose uh, I did lose to Ryan because of Sling Gang Lieutenant. Essentially, I need to have my trample creatures to be able to win. And the game that I did have trample creatures, I won. And then the other two games, I didn't have enough, and then I lost. 
So that was really frustrating because uh, I actually think that I have a good matchup against Ryan, but that's not how it ended up playing out. Uh, yeah. And Ryan's deck was very good, and Ryan's a very, also a very good player. So he also identified, we talked a lot about what was important in our matchups like afterwards, and we basically had like the strategy for each other nailed down pretty well, and he just, you know, he drew the cards and I was shall able simply to play draw them sequentially. Slinging, Lieutenant, as is my yeah. win condition. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I could have done the same thing if I drew like if I drew uh, Ranker, if I yeah if I drew Ranker and the and uh, Banner Hide Crew Shock, another Modern and, Horizons card that is cracked for its rate. Yeah, that's, yeah, that card's really. I knew that card. I actually knew that card was really good, but uh, I knew no one else was gonna, was going to play that, so I got that really late. Oh uh, yeah, if I drew those cards and like a, and like my Lightning Strike, I was like, well, I could I could probably win, and that's how I that's how I won the second game, as I had the four four. Uh, the crew shock, and then a removal spell, and I was able to do that, and then one off of the base of that, or untethered, untethered express. That's the other one. Overall, I was uh, very happy with my decision to go into red and green, not because, not because obviously my record, but because what I was saying about green is it's just the shallowest color. I don't think it's weak. The top crust of green is very good. Like the the, the red green cards that I drafted are all incredibly powerful. Blood Braid Elf, Burning Tree Emissary. Domri's Ambush, you have my Iconoclast, even Grumgully, which ended up being not... I ended up siding that card out. I'd say the second most frequent side out for me. Interesting. Was was Grumgully. Yeah, it... Did you it, have a lot of well, humans? Turns, I didn't actually look through your deck at the type lines. No, nope. I had like two humans. It was just that by the time you were at three mana, you'd already cast most of your cards? No, I'd, it didn't attack. It, it was, uh, you know, it was slow and off of curb. So, I mean... Now I didn't I didn't side it out frequently and it's it wasn't bad. It's pretty darn good to cascade uh, into off Blood Bright Elf is all I'm saying. I, that's when that was the dream. I never it never happened. I have lived that dream. It's a good dream to live. And the the card I sided out most, which I knew was going to be the case, was Fires of Yavimaya. That was my last card um, because that was just like a that was another high uh, a high floor card that was always going to come out for whatever my best sideboard cards was. So that was fine. I sided that out. Literally every single. Is that a high floor card? You mean a high game. ceiling card? Because the floor on Yavimaya, Fires Yavimaya, is it does nothing because you have no board. That's not how my my deck <laughs> operates. In- so. Incorrect. He has a board. <laughs> that never. That never happened. You do. That never you happened. Do you consider one it a high floor card? For no, not overall. I think for the deck that I have. Interesting. Okay. It was a high floor card. Yeah. It's it was a, a removal spell or, or a, a pump spell that also grants haste. I thought it was really interesting in this draft to like look at how the different decks broke down against each other because you mentioned that you were afraid of your matchup against Zach and that it was a really tough lineup for your deck. Yeah. That was one of my really, really close matches, and uh, I actually think my deck is probably a little bit favored of that matchup. Zach's a better Magic player than I am, and you know there's always variance in Magic, but we had a really, really tight game three. And that's just because I have a ton of removal, right? Like I wasn't worried about any of his mm-hmm. first strikers. He basically never got to trigger Heroic on me once. He, I was just removing all this stuff before he could do anything about it. It's really interesting to me how this sort of meta worked out, which is, I want to transition, Anthony, to briefly just asking you about, put away your player hat, forget that, you know, you drafted tracks, so went to seven, ignore all that stuff. Just talk about, as a cube designer, looking at, like, the overall records here, people's feelings about their matchups, how do you feel about the results of this rotisserie draft? Is this how you would want it to go? Yeah, I mean, first of all, just as a, as a designer, the number one thing is, are people having a good time? And the impression I got, hopefully people are being reasonably honest about their experience. I think people had a good time and they had, like you said, a lot of really interesting dynamic matches that came down to a lot of, you know, novel, interesting board states, which is definitely a priority that, you know, I'm trying to focus on in this environment. It was really interesting to see the difference between a rotisserie draft and a booster draft and how a lot of features of this environment kind of played out in different ways that... I think it's still really meaningful and fun in a different way in both contexts, and specifically how there's a lot of little overlapping synergies. It's not really like this color pair is all about this one theme, so you just kind of get on rails and well, do it. We have established red green is all about reducing your opponent's life total to zero as True. quickly as yeah. possible. <laughs> um, Pretty yeah, linear my deck. Way to play magic. <laughs> and and yeah. related to that, like we were talking about, having a lot of cards that are you know C minuses Ds in a lot of decks, but not necessarily Fs, and then having just a lot of incremental ways to increase the value of your individual cards, your individual pieces of your deck. And I think the way that that translates to a draft is you have this kind of dynamic experience where you're trying to figure out how do you optimize those individual cards and make choices to maximize everything you've done before. In the rotisserie draft, it was all about 
the hate drafting and how to how to correctly evaluate what other people are going to take so you could maximize the the cards that are going into your deck and i think that played it really well in the sense that people were fighting over stuff until i mean at least pick 25 or further uh which to me that just creates the the fun dynamic draft experience that i would hope to see i felt like i never got to a point where i was like I'm safe. I was like yeah. fighting until the very end. Or I was like, well, somebody's going to take either Fire Prophecy or Magma Jet. I guess yeah. I'll get the other one, right? Like, I'm going to play one of those in my deck. And sure enough, Justin took Magma Jet. So it's like, until the very last pick, I was like, I I felt like I had to constantly fight people. Yep. I had to take the one that cascaded off Bloodbright Elf. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I want to shout out one card. I had seven sideboard cards. I cited all of them in at least one time. Uh, but there's one card that was by far my best sideboard card. It wasn't even remotely close, and it probably won me multiple games of Magic. Do we want to say it, or do we want to guess? Any, I'm going to guess, guess Collision Colossus? Okay. Do I remember what Wait, was no, actually thrash in threat. your which sideboard? One's which, which is the one that kills a flyer? Is it Thrash Threat, or, or is it Collision Colossus? Collision Colossus. Thrash Threat was in my main deck. Okay, that, yeah. the that one that kills a flyer is fantastic. the one that I'm thinking of. The, the split card that kills a flyer is what I'm guessing. Anthony's thinking. What I'm not sure of is what was what was in your sideboard. Do you know off the top of your head? Oh, I'll, t- I'll tell you. I'll just read it down. Carrie Zev's Expertise, Boon Seder, Magma Jet, Nature's Chant, Collision Colossus, Cinderclasm, Legion Lord. That uh, could be Expertise. I'm going to guess it's either Expertise or Cinderclasm. It was Cinderclasm, and it was absolutely nuts in this deck. I, as it turned out, did not have a massive amount of two toughness creatures. Trust me, as the person with a lot of two toughness burn spells, I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. So uh, it was. I mean, I cite. I, I think I cited it in five of the matchups. I cited it in against Andy. I cited it against Ryan. I cited it in against Parker. I cited it in against Zach, and maybe four. At least four. Maybe probably five. Ian. I would I imagine. Cited, Did you say Ian? Already? Oh, I cited it against. Oh, I cited in against McDarby. I think I also cited in against Ian, so six of the matches. It's pretty good against Steel Overseer and Thopters as well, so I wouldn't be totally surprised if you brought it in our matchup as well. I did not bring it in at, in our matchup. I only brought in Nature's Chant because I didn't have another card I wanted to take out. Fair enough. I mean, and that's not a knock. I just felt like I had a... Yeah, like, I mean, your, my... your plan, my, my plan was obviously just a little bit enough slower than yours that you could just focus on being aggressive and consistent. Yeah, yeah. So they just you know, bring it in the disenchant just to uh, just to kind of catch you off guard for your your big blockers like Traxos yeah. and and Sphinx Summoner was that's that, that's what I felt like I needed. Yeah, seven sideboard cards, side of them all in. Uh, you know, I, I I really appreciated the the depth of cards for a rotisserie draft for a cube of this size for things that actually made sense that weren't just like oh, I'll just, I have extra picks, I'll draft this. Like, everything, to me, felt meaningful from a matchup perspective, like, for multiple matchups. I think this was a great, very successful draft. I want to remind everybody that Anthony made a fantastic rotisserie draft template that's available for, I mean, you can find the link on our website. It's on Google Sheets. It's a Google Sheets template you can copy. I recommend doing this with your local playgroup if uh, you have a reason to, or if you have a remote playgroup and you're going to be meeting up for some event, I think it's a really fun thing to do, so... Highly recommend rotisserie drafting. This was a great time. Uh, I really enjoyed playing my deck, which I was thinking about it. I think that like that what defines my deck is I had no slam dunk matchups. There was no matchup where it was like, oh, I win this easy. And there was none of that. It was always like, I'm a little favored here, maybe, if I can like, you know, do things in the right order. But I had a great time playing my deck, and I think everybody else had a fun time. Maybe the only person who didn't have the most fun time Parker. was Parker. Parker ended up drafting a deck he didn't even like. He was just like, I don't know. It feels like the only deck that's open. Well, m- well maybe Parker should have stopped drafting everyone else's deck and focused on <laughs> drafting his own deck. He was focused what on decks figuring, were out, left, figuring out the what food decks plan. decks were left? It was rough. I w- well, as Anthony said multiple times, there's 10 two-color pairs and there's 10 drafters. And Parker decided, I have identified three other color pairs that people are drafting. <laughs> I'd also like to he draft those. He should have been blue-green, so I guess. I do... I do not feel. I think blue green was unplayable. I think well, that was actually the that's only one the that was open deck, Justin. I'm not sure what else you wanted <laughs> him to do. That's that's fair. I don't. I don't. What is blue green supposed to do? It's not supposed to do anything. But it's it's that's okay, fine. Great. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that was the only one of like because I was going through the color pairs and I was just like, what is this? I don't even know what this deck looks like. So yeah, I mean, the best blue green decks that we've seen, I think, are more just like green decks that have some blue cards to refill their hand late, and they're <laughs> probably some other also playing cards, some other yeah. colors as well. Yeah. Okay. So the best blue green decks are the ones that have green cards, but also, but also blue cards. Yeah, it's blue it's cards. Big, it's green decks big, that green, play Mold Drifter, basically, pretty much. Correct. Is what you want yeah. to Maybe okay. throw in a okay. uh, what's it called? The Reign of Revelation. 
Sure. That was the only that was the only color pair that I I thought was that I absolutely didn't want to be in. I didn't I wasn't super excited to be in black green, but I thought black green did have a couple of of really sweet cards uh and you could probably just lean on the on the power of black, but that obviously didn't. Well, it's a good thing you took Blood Raid Elf, Justin, because uh, it was approaching my pick. You were seat eight, I was seat 10, and I was for sure going to go Blood Raid Elf into Arc Lightning if it was still available. That would have been my one-two punch to start off the draft, no doubt. Nice. Yeah, but I sure, I probably would have figured out a way to lose with that deck anyway, but, but you know. I felt felt pretty good, felt pretty good. I felt like I, uh, I was able to, I was able to play well. I was like, I was super focused. Like I was like, I I was like, I had laid out my mana curve and was like, all right thinking about like each of the different interactions between my cards. So I felt, I felt prepared and I really wanted to win, but I'll take second. Yeah. I'll take second out of 10. That's, That's right. very, uh, very I'll magnanimous get, of you to, uh, yeah, thank to you. allow I'm Ryan to humble. win. <laughs> yeah. I'll get, I'll get him back at some point. Yeah. I'll get him back at some point. I don't know when, but I'll get him back. To close here, Justin, I wanted to just ask you if you had any, Cube takes from uh, from the past, I don't know, like year-ish or 18 months since uh, since you've been on the 540. I know that a lot of our listeners miss that podcast dearly, miss hearing your opinions on things. So you've got a platform now. Do you have any thoughts on the uh, the last 18 months worth of Cube? Oh, wow. Well, I would like to start by noting that um, the hosts of the 540 had a combined 14 wins in the rotisserie draft, and the hosts... All of them, if, even if you include Parker, had a combined eight. <laughs> so, thank you. Noted. <laughs> we are we. You I know, felt- at, at Lucky Paper, we really like to stay focused on the data. We think it's really powerful. Uh, so we appreciate. Well, this, there's this some data for you. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a nice graph somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, I have. Uh, yeah, I thought a little bit about Cube since since my my time at the. I'm sure you did not stop thinking of- about Cube. I'm pretty sure you can't, even if you wanted to. I could not. I could not. I do want to say before we get to this part, I have come. I've reached the point for myself that I no longer need to bring my cube to any event. I've accomplished my goal, which is get enough people into cube that I will always have a cube to draft wherever I go. So I've just decided, like after Phil, like I'm, I, if it's not at, like near my house or at like a local store, I'm just like not going to bring my cube. Someone's got a cube. I'll just draft that. Yeah, I didn't bring any of my cubes to KubeCon last year. I didn't bring any to Philly. I'm just playing other people's cubes. There's plenty of people around yeah, with that's... cubes, which is a, a great a great community yeah. to be in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so, all right, there's been like, oh, I don't know, like what is like 40 sets that have come out since the end of 2021 There's been like, you know, now. 20 sets, 20 separate commander products. Yeah. Okay. About 95 well, okay, secret well, layers. Let's just hit the uh, hit the main sets then. So I think that starts with Crimson Val and then goes to Frixie All Will Be One. Yeah. So I'm just gonna give you I'm just gonna give you a hot take on on just like a card or so on each of the set. Crimson Val. I believe that the card by invitation only is the best designed white sweeper of all time. Best designed, you say? Tell me more. So for yes. those that don't know, this is the the sweeper that says that uh, you cast it for three white white, and you can choose any number between zero and thirteen. It probably says one and thirteen because why would you choose zero? It does say zero and thirteen. Oh, there you go. Uh, and then each player sacrifices yeah. that many creatures. And to answer your question, why does it say zero? Because sometimes you can cast it against a deck that can sacrifice their own creatures with a goblin bombardment or something like that. Right, because you don't choose to they resolution. sacrifice their creatures. That's and true. then it resolves. You're like, oh, zero creatures, cool, no problem. I'll just keep my two creatures that I had, and you've sacrificed four of yours. Which is part of the reason that the design is so wonderful is because one, this is a five mana wrath, which I believe in most cubes is the correct amount of mana for a wrath effect. And that is not because of a power level, but because wraths that are cheaper can sometimes be hate cards against aggressive decks. And I'm using that very loosely, but uh, I believe that for aggressive decks to be able to flourish in a cube that you can't have too many cheap sweepers. Just flat out. As a I man think who just pretty... picked up a Terminus to put into my cube, I have to say different strokes, Justin, different strokes. I like attacking. You like you like fiddling. I, <laughs> it's funny because my reputation in our local playgroup is as a very aggressive player. I don't know what I am, man. I don't know. Andy Mangold, fiddler on the roof with cantrips i i do like cantrips but that's because i don't that's because i want to keep doing stuff i don't want to sit there doing nothing i don't i hate board stalls that's my uh, that's my number uh, one hated yeah, thing and this is where we differ you're like i want to keep doing something you know what doing something is going to your combat drawing, step every time and turn your creature sideways it's not a board stall if you're drawing I for casting aggro. Brainstorm. I play all kinds of aggro 
<laughs> anyway. anyway, by invitation only is five mana, which is a, a good spot for a lot of cubes to allow for a very powerful sweeper that can still not just sweep the leg out from under aggressive decks. And on top of that, obviously I identified the uh, the situation that if you're playing against some different style of decks, there's a lot of like mind games of like how many creatures you're going to be sacking when, when, it, when the spell resolves. But on top of all of those things, this is a sweeper you can play in aggressive decks. So I love that fact. That, that is the unique thing you, about it, right? I can't think of any other. I mean, yeah. maybe you could argue Winds of Abandon is kind of in this space because the overloaded cost is like mm. a Plague Wind and mm-hmm. you can play it in an aggressive deck. It's just a cheap removal spell. But I think that is what sets by invitation only apart from every other board wipe. Is that a good thing from a design perspective, you think? Or is it not good to let any deck free roll a Wrath of God, essentially? I don't think like a, like a five mana spell is a free roll in any sense. Because if you're playing an aggressive deck and you're like, are you really free rolling a five mana card in your deck? I mean, I not like, I never am. You saw my curve, my rotisserie draft deck. I don't want five yeah, mana spells, but, uh, but most people exactly. are. But, but that's, well, I don't, I mean, are they? I don't know. I, I think that, I think having a five mana spell is a deck building concession that you should get the reward of. All right. If you're playing an aggressive deck, if most of your cards are ones or twos, I think going all the way up to five, which is something that most aggressive decks don't want to do then having a card that is truly like a sledgehammer for you, if you have four creatures, they have two creatures, guess what? It's basically, it's barter and blood now that can scale in any direction. So I think by invitation only is excellent. That's my hot take for Crimson Vale. Only 39 sets to go. It's, nope. uh, it's very similar, I think. I think the card it's actually most similar to is one I don't see it compared to often, which is eliminate the competition. And what it is is an eliminate the competition that removes all of the blow up potential of counter spells and like counterplay in the, in the way of like Goblin Bombardment and stuff. Because... You got to mm. sacrifice all those creatures to cast eliminate comp- the competition, and then what happens from there? Who knows? Whereas this, you just put on the stack, and then you wait for your opponent to squirm. I mean, it's also more of a modal spell where sometimes it's eliminate the competition, and sometimes it's wrath of God, and that yes. combination is pretty powerful. I think it's pretty yeah. interesting you point this card out because, as far as I understand it, they only designed this card this way because they had the constraint of we love to get the number thirteen on more cards in these <laughs> Innistrad sets. So, like, how can we make a wrath that has the number thirteen on it? That makes this card feel almost accidental that it was it was implemented this way. But we love to talk about how constraints breed creativity because they force you to look at problems differently. So, I think it's a very cool card to point out. All right, next set, next big set, uh, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Well, I think this pretty is pretty good a, one. Yeah, we had. Uh, well, I guess we didn't talk, but, uh, you know, for the end of year cube article that Lucky Paper released, I, I submitted some stuff for that. And I claimed, as, as well as a number of other people did, that, ne- that Neon Dynasty was the best cube set of the last year. And I still stand by that. I think it just has a wonderful depth of unique strategies that you can support your cube with. It's got plenty of high-powered cards. But I'm actually going to talk about a card that I, I don't see come up very frequently that I think that more people should be cubing with, and that's Shigiki Jukai Visionary. Are you guys familiar with this one? I am. This I couldn't give you all the text stuff, off the right? top of it. I know it's a two-drop that you can pay some mana to put back in your hand and get a land, and then it's got a channel ability, too, to do something. Channel. Yeah, so it's it does. So it's a 1-3 a for two, and you can pay one and a green, and which is also its casting cost. Tap it. Return it to your hand. Look at the top four cards of your deck. If there's a land among them, you can put it on the battlefield. The rest go into your graveyard, which is very notable for its second ability, which is channel XX green, where you can, or I think it's XX green green. Yeah, two green. I don't know. X, like. Yeah, XX green green, where you can simply regrowth any non-legendary cards. So this is a very, like, grindy card. Super and grindy. I, and the, super I'm not sure you grindy. said it, but a 1-3 stat line too, which in a lot of environments yeah, a, is also going to slow things down quite a bit. Yeah, a def- definitely a grindy card. And I, th- But I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of cubes that really like, like to play that play style. I played uh, at Philly, Dave McDarby's Live the Dream Cube, which is just like a large, a large mana, like not a lot of aggressive, well, he said there wasn't a lot of aggressive decks. I drafted an aggressive deck and it was very good. But he uh, is game- aiming for a large mana type gameplay. And I think even in a mid rangey centric cube that a card like this is still very good because it plays at all phases of the game. And then if you draw it late, when you have like eight lands out, that's just return three cards from your graveyard to your hand. And it's at instant speed because it's a channel ability. And it's also not even a spell you cast. Yeah, it's not even a spell you cast. So I really like this card. It's a card that I might try to cube with at some point, but... It's one that I have not seen in a single cube that I've looked at. Not to say it's not, 
I just haven't, I have not seen any cubes that I've drafted or I've looked at lists of, so. If we wanted to, we could go to the cube map and see exactly where the cubes that it's in are distributed, but uh, I agree, I haven't seen it come up much in conversation, and it does strike me as a, uh, you know, it's not the most efficient rate on any side of it, but the fact that it is so modal, and also it's just, I mean, a two mana 1-3 is really good in some matchups, right? Like, that, mm -hmm. that kind of stat line I don't think is often talked about as being, like, appealing because in some matchups you don't want it at all. But those are the matchups where you're activating this thing and you're, you know, channeling it to get cards back. You're not blocking with it. So being able to just put a decent blocker in your deck at very little cost is also a, a good virtue. Yeah, I mean, it really plays into the entire thing of the card because you just want to elongate the game. And having a 1-3 blocker on turn two, that helps doing that. So great card. Good call. All right, out. next set. New Capena, Streets of New Capena. I believe that Ledger Shredder is a top five blue creature of all time for cubes. I'm not going to disagree I don't know there. How, I love Ledger Shredder. I was going to say, I don't know how hot of a take that is, but I think that people think this card is good, and I think it's even better than that. This is another card that scales with the power level of the cube. It does, yeah. And those those type of cards can just not be understated. At the highest power level, being able to put cards into your graveyard very quickly and being able to activate that connive on multiple turns, including the turn you play it, even if it's on turn two, that cannot be understated, and the more, obviously, the higher power level it is, the more frequently your opponents are also going to activate that connive ability. At lower power cubes, it's still a very powerful card, just because even doing that a couple of times is incredibly powerful for a two-drop. Yeah, so, I love this card. Yeah, I, like I said, I don't know how hot of a take this is. I, I think... You I just worry about your it's... takes being hot, Justin. We care about your takes, even yeah. if other people agree, you know? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, but I just think that this, I, I don't know, I think I'm higher on this card than most people. I also just really like the design of it. Uh, you know, for all of the, I love my cheap Spells Mattery payoffs, as this uh, rotisserie draft demonstrates, and I like that this one is pretty different than the other ones we have. You know, it's kind of like a weird combination of Dragon's Rage Channeler in that it like, you know, gives you a little bit of uh, card selection throughout the game as you're just doing your thing and also just scales into a giant threat a la, you know, a Sprite Dragon or something. But it's like somewhere mm -hmm. in between in this space that it's not the best at either of those roles, but it does a little bit of everything, which I think is really great. It also Definitely. just hit me yeah. that it's it's pretty funny that this card is an advisor. It's like, hey, what do we do? We got to we got yeah, shred, shred the books. Yeah, <laughs> shred the books. Get rid of the books before the cops <laughs> yeah. show up. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's great. I love it. I'm I'm advising you to always draw and discard no matter what. Oh, for you sure. You like the cards in your hand? Guess what? Draw and discard. I'm telling you it's what you need to do. And that's what it does. Yeah. I think it's great. I also love the name. I love the name Ledger Shredder. I think it's yeah, that's perfect like That's a that's an A, a plus name when they came up that with perfect that perfect assonance. It's just uh, so good. There's one uh, I agree with, next, Justin. Yeah, you haven't said anything totally disgusting yet. We'll see if you get there. <laughs> well, you give me time. I, I have. Well, I have one you're going to disagree with. All right, great. Baldur's Gate. Hot take here. Displacer Kitten. I really dislike this card because the play patterns for it in both directions just make for an unengaging game. You either win the game or you lose the game with Displacer Kitten. And when I say lose the game, it's because it can often be a four mana card that you're putting planning to put a lot of resources into that can just die very easily and it feels very bad it's got the soul herder problem because of yeah it has the soul herder problem but it costs even one more mana and then of course when you are able to untap with it and your opponent can't do anything it is such an incredible unfair snowball card for a lot of cubes that it still creates an unfun game state because it's almost a, i don't know if you've either of you have played had the opportunity to play against a, a displacer kitten that can just go 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 with you know with one and two drops but um it basically is like it's it makes the game seem like it's still within reach, but truly it never is. And those are those are cards that I try to avoid playing in cubes, despite it even supporting an archetype that I like, which is blink. Yeah, for those that so, don't know, this is it's three to blue for a two two, and whenever you cast a non creature spell, you flicker any non land permit you control and just bring it right back immediately, which has a lot of combo potential. This is actually played in Legacy. Have you seen the Displacer Kit and Coveted Jewel Legacy decks, Justin? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. kind of wild. It's it's pretty pretty sick to see Coveted Jewel seeing Legacy play. I have not actually played a cube with this card in it. I have actually in like the various discords and stuff been like, why are more people playing this card? It just seems like people love. Flickery strategies in cubes of all power levels. Mm -hmm. It, you know, is this cool card that makes you think about different ways to combine it with other cards. And I, you know, I agree with you, Justin. I don't think it's any more in that category than a card like Soul Hoarder already is. And that card is beloved by mm -hmm. so many people in the cube community. So I haven't seen this one getting much mileage, but I think it's, uh, it's kind of a cool card if a card that is very, very swingy. Yeah, for sure. Okay, here's the one that you're gonna hate. Okay, Andy specifically, Dominaria United. I absolutely love Leyline Binding. And I want to see more payoffs 
for greedy land draft. Wow, like, like triumphs. triumphs? Oh, yeah, Triumphs. Uh, speak on it, speak on it. Can't get enough of it. I love Triumphs because they're obviously very powerful, and you could say that they make having to fix your mana immaterial because it's get three colors of mana in one land, and that is very powerful. They even have land types. You can fetch them up. But in cubes that, that I design, I always like to push aggressive decks as much as possible. And these are lands that are high picks from a power level perspective because they do such good work on the mana fixing side that come into play tapped 100 times out of 100. And that, to me, is a very big drawback for a land in a medium, medium plus powered cube. So I'm, I'm on Team Triumph. Not just for that reason. I also just love left drafting lands. Like I think I'd said in the uh, in the Discord for the rotisserie draft, and we were talking, we somehow got on triumphs because I think Dave McDarby and myself are both like absolutely love triumphs. That like my ideal deck, my ideal just nonsense cube deck is is casting a Traxa and then revealing like two more triumphs, a Golos and an Omnath, and I already have one triumph in play. That's the type of magic at this point that I I just. That, that I also want to play. If I'm not, like, drafting aggressive decks, which I really enjoy drafting, I want to draft big, dumpy, nonsense, over-the-top decks. And Leyline Binding is the perfect card for those decks. I would love to see more cards like Leyline Binding. Yeah, you know, as fun as it would be to fight with you, I don't have any problem with Leyline Binding. I think the card is cool. I don't happen to prefer that kind of deck. I think it's really hard to design a cube where that kind of deck is viable and also not just... It's so easy to draft mm. that deck if you want to because you can play so many of the cards in the cube that you can mm-hmm. kind of just choose to do it at will. And in the cubes I've played where those kinds of strategies are viable, it feels like the feels like they're the best thing to be doing. And I love pushing aggressive strategies. I, my my cube is super low curving, and that's why I'm on triple shock lands. I just like I want people to, to pay a lot of life to their mana base. And if you want to play three colors, great, you can, but Instead of lands coming into play tapped, you're, they're going to cost you a ton of life, and then we give you that choice. So, yeah, I don't know. We've, it's funny. Like, we, I wrote the article on the Triumph thing, and I had written my like my treatise against Triumphs before I got your answers back, Justin. And your answer was simply, "I love Triumphs. They're great. I'm so glad we got them finished." And it was very funny to have that sort of a dichotomy in the yeah. end of the article. But man, I got to tell you, having an opinion in public, there were so many people at KubeCon that came up to me and like showed me a triumph like they were showing a vampire a uh, like cross they were like "Ooh, look out andy it's a triumph what are you gonna do and i was like eh. i drafted one in a couple drafts and people were like you took a triumph i'm like yeah they're good cards i recognize <laughs> that they're good i'm a player now i'll play the triumph listeners this is a good bit and you should keep it up uh, it's, it's not working i'm not triggered <laughs> stop <laughs> saying i'm owned <laughs> but you see i actually like this card it- specifically for the domain keyword, because I feel like it does give a little bit more structure to those kinds of five color decks where it's not just about yes. like, I'm going to play five colors and just play all the best cards I can. It It is about like, oh, I really want to complete this cycle and sort of complete this quest, this mini game of getting all the basic land types, which we have a bunch of domain cards now. I think that's something you can actually uh, sort of pursue as a theme and a, a, a different way to add a unique texture to a draft. Look, honestly, anything that's a five color land payoff that isn't like another stupid Omnath that just does a million things and you can't beat it as soon as it resolves. Sounds great. I'm all in for interactive five five color payoffs. I mean, I see. I, I actually, and I agree with you saying like a lot of times, if this is a thing that you can regularly do, drafting the four and five color deck, it's often the best thing that you can be doing in that cube. And I like to try to design a cube that has that as an ability to do, but that comes at the cost of you're going to be operating significantly slower than a lot of other people, and there you could pay for that in that way. Yeah. So. And to be clear, yeah, I think I there's like a to five-color like deck in my both. cube, too, right? Like, I play Golos, and I think that it's not in every draft thing, but some drafts, a, like, four- or five-color deck comes together, and that's about the density that I'm happy with it to have it there. Yeah. It's the stuff like Omnath and, like, Niv-Mizzet that gets me where it's literally unplayable if you're not playing a five-color deck. Like, you'll play uh, Golos in, like, a green deck to go get your guy's Cradle sometimes, or just any deck to go get Field of the Dead. Like, it's not just a five-color card, but it can also kind of serve that role. But, yeah, I yeah. don't think our I don't think our perspectives are actually that far off here, Justin, other than... I think you happen to like a particular type of deck that I'm not super into at the moment. But, you know, my... That's that's not what I my heard. My tastes come and go. <laughs> to my tastes come and go, radio. you know. So, I don't know. We'll see. What do you think of Clothis, uh, Justin? This is, it's just a miserable card. Okay, you can't see, interact with it. I agree completely. <laughs> I hate that card. I would never put that in a cube. I would never put that in, in a cube. that I, Actually, that's... I did initially when it came out. But after after, you know, playing a bit with it, 
uh, I would never like put that back in a cube that that I have. That one is kind of like showing a cross to a vampire for me. Like I don't want to play a cube where cloth is in it. That's not the kind of magic I'm in for. Yeah, it's just like it's just so unfun. It's so unfun. Anyway, what's the next set? Uh, Unfinity. I I opted out of that set. I don't have a hot take. Yeah, me too. I actually don't know the rules yeah. text of almost any cards in that whole set. Yeah, I'm just like they 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 lost me on that one. There are there cool cube cards in there? Maybe. Tell me about them, but I, I don't know them. Hey, I mean, so. they're serving their goal of uh, making magic for a bunch of different audiences because now they make a bunch of stuff I don't care about all of a sudden. So I guess that's part of their goal, but it's working. All right, next set is... Uh, oh, we'll talk about this one. Uh, Warhammer 40K. I think this whole set is a match. It's sick. Just They spent time on this set. Yeah, it's amazing. And truly, it truly is. It truly is just like comprehensively a masterpiece for a lot of different types of magic. Cube in general, there's a lot of really sweet cube cards. My my two favorite ones, oh, there's so many good there's ones. There's a lot of good set. ones. Noise Marine, I really love. Really great Cascade card. Cascade, Cascade is such a fun mechanic, and it's not too powerful. Noise Marine's not too powerful. That's a card I was hoping was going to be in the regular cube, but it wasn't. I, can, I don't I know if it's too powerful. into a Noise Marine. It's, I mean, it's it costs five, you know? You just want to be able to it's live a three the dream. Two, you know. That's a, yeah, it's a 3-2. Uh, and then Chaos Defiler, I think, is the probably the best cube card in the set. That card's just super nuts. That's the... I'm trying to remember it. Three uh, red that's black the card. Artifact creature, horror, enter the battlefield. You destroy a non-land permanent well, of your choice of your opponents. Enter or leave the battlefield. Enter or leave, yep. and it's a cho- chosen. You choose one for each opponent randomly and then destroy it. So it doesn't... Uh, I don't think it targets is the thing that I was trying to think about. No, but you get to choose, though. Well, yeah, but I'm meaning like it's like it's like Council's Judgment text. Right, right. I got yes. to play this uh, over Let the weekend in David McDarby's Live the Dream Cube, and it was very fun to randomly yeah. destroy a target creature. For each, yeah, it, choose a non land permanent. Yeah, so yeah, it, yeah. it's choose. That's you a, destroy one deal. at random after you choose one for each opponent. So in a one on one game of Magic, the red and miss is totally removed. You just destroy right. a thing. Correct. But it's not targeted. You're right. It's choose it's on resolution. It's not targeted. Yeah. yeah, or dies. So so enters or dies. So this card is just, this card's kind of just, just ridiculous. It's cracked. Yeah, 5 4 trample for 5. <laughs> yeah. What a, what a ridiculous card but it costs five so you know it's probably fine anyway warhammer is a great i i could i could talk about a ton of cards but well, i don't know we've been talking for a while so i'll, I'll continue to move on i i do think so for that whole that whole i great. totally agree i think there's a lot of cube players we have learned from running the survey and stuff that just completely opt out of any like non-standard sets like any commander product or anything they just don't even look at it at all and I think this set has a ton of deep, deep stuff here that enables all kinds of cube strategies that... There's a ton of unique effects in here, right? Like, cards like Poxwalkers mm-hmm. and Triarch Praetorian, like, these cards are just not really like anything else we've gotten, or they're, like, better versions than cards that are already supporting archetypes in people's cubes. So I think there's a ton of untapped potential here from a cube design perspective. And all I see people talking about is, like, stupid Triumph of St. Catherine, which that card is also an abomination. You do not get to have a two-mana 5-5 five, five lifelink. That's not okay. That's dumb. <laughs> yeah, lifelink is uh, lifelink is generally more of a problematic keyword than a lot of people are willing to admit. But that's a see, Justin, you and I agree with on so much. We have more yeah. in common just, than we have that we don't share. <laughs> I just think that I just like I just like aggressive decks, and that that's like the most anti-aggressive card that I've ever seen in my entire life. It's like offensively anti-aggressive. Anyway, what's the next set? Brothers War. Oh yeah. So I'm going to repeat the one that I said in the end of the year article. And that is the card Arcane Proxy I was really excited about. And I have never, I cannot remember the last time I was more disappointed by a card than Arcane Proxy. I didn't like this I card either. Don't... I was like, maybe, I was kind of like middling on it. And the first couple times I like put it in my cube just to like see how it felt. I like drafted it in the deck that would supposedly want it. And it just wasn't yep. making the main deck. And I was like, this card's just not there. Like it's not, it's, it's, it's not I doing it. I think it sucks. <laughs> the card actually sucks. Like, and, and no, there are usually I'm on team. Like there's, you know, there's a cube for every card. I, I, there's, man. there's plenty of cubes for arcane proxy, but it is not more power motivated yeah, cubes that a lot of people maybe think the it's pitch of in. your voice d- betrays you. <laughs> For, for for saying that that's true. But you know what? We'll, we'll agree to disagree. I think Arcane Pox is terrible. That's my hot take. All right. Uh, there's got to be something better. It is funny. I just yeah, threw it into the flag. cube map, and it is only being tested really in the like high-powered cube region. People where I don't really think it's good. People haven't yeah. experimented well, that's, with it. That's where context. it's worst. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, I think because yeah. people think or thought that it is viable there, that might have a lot of other more niche cube designers thinking it's too good for their environment when I don't think it is. I think in a lot of like, Mm. you know, middle power artifact matters environments, like it could be perfectly viable and cool, but 
people I think are maybe are like, oh, that card's like a mythic that's like a bomb. It's not, it's too good. It's going to like, you know, overrun my environment, which I don't think it would in most places. Well, okay. So in an artifact centric cube, what are you doing with it? You get get back Cassin your uh, spells. one of your. I mean, there's, there's plenty of spells in artifact <laughs> yeah. matter in artifact matters cubes. It's just you know, even if you turn the artifacts up by like you know twenty or thirty percent, that really makes a big difference in terms of the perceived themes of the environment. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course. Yeah, but what you're so getting you're back? Like, shatter, you're, you're, Justin. You're getting back. Uh, I don't know some artifact cantrip. I don't know what they're what they're called. I don't play artifact. Artifact games. can't. You know, artifact cantrips are spell bombs. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, I meant I meant cantrips that find <laughs> artifacts, not cantrips that are artifacts. But oh, so like consider you're flashing back. Consider sure, yeah. I guess yeah. I mean, all right. I'm I'm not gonna draft it. Like there, there. That's the thing. Like I just don't. I can't envision a time where in a pack that I'm drafting, I'm like, this is what I want. This really underwhelming Snapcaster Mage that you have to cast, you can't even get the ability when you don't cast it. This is what I want. Anyway, hate Arcane Proxy, moving on. Uh, oh, the, the, we're up to the next set. Phyrexia, all we won. I like a lot of cards in this set. I think there are a lot. there's a lot of like really medium cards. Like I really like Kaido, but it seems kind of like a No Man's Land card for for like fitting into cubes. I Does that enjoyed the play patterns of Kaido at uh, I had it in my pre-release pool and I thought it was really fun to play with, but yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah, it is in this space where it's like, okay, you got to be in for planeswalkers, you got to be not at like the peaks of power level because it's not, you know, mm-hmm. one of the best blue black cards of all time. But I do think there's a lot of interesting space there. It, it's like it, I guess it, you know, plays with the ninjutsu stuff, which is Kaido's whole thing uh, and like, you know, flicker strategies, but yeah, I don't know. I, I agree. I think it's a cool card that maybe doesn't have a, a perfect home. Yeah. Yeah, and then on top of so I love Atraxa out of out of uh, this set that kind of goes back to my you know our discussion about Leyline Binding, and the card that I think that most people are sleeping on in this set is Vron Thrain Thane Executioner. That's the a legendary two mana blood artist act- blood. Effect. Yeah, exactly. That's a, a yeah two two blood artist uh, esque one and a black, and it says whenever another creature you control dies drain someone for two it happens only once each turn and people are really turned off by two of the things of this of the only happening once a turn and only your creatures but two is a lot and it's also a two two and i think that this card is just significantly better than people are giving it credit for i haven't updated my cube for this set or for several of the sets we're talking about (laughs) but this is a card that i'm absolutely going to put in to try to bolster continue to bolster the uh the sacrifice thing i just think it's I think it's significantly more powerful than people think. Two is a heck of a lot, and it comes on a two-two body. Yeah, draining for two is a lot, as Shouldred has shown us. I think, and that—that's exactly the yeah. same as hitting with a two-powered life linker. Is all I'm saying. You know, life link. It's oppressive, people. It's basically cloth. Get it out of there. Uh, yeah, Vram was actually the ninth most popular card in the set on our survey, but overall, this set was not okay. very well loved on the survey at all. Like, it's only got 15% of our respondents testing it, so that on other sets would be like way lower down on the list. So. Yeah, not a particularly popular card uh, in a set that didn't have a ton of slam dunks for most people. Yeah, I believe that. There's a this set is on its face like looks very parasitic mechanically. I think that's kind of a misnomer because a lot of the cards are kind of just independently good that have oil counters or have toxic on them. But like, I mean, if you're like, I don't want to. It's the only card with the toxic or the only card with an oil counter in my cube that cares about oil counters. Then I don't really want to get in for that. So I get that, but. I, I think there's definitely more going on in this set than people are probably giving credit for, but I also say this as someone that hasn't updated their cube in like six months, so I, what do I know? I, everyone else is, is probably more invested in me than in, in those type of things. We've kept you for a long time tonight, Justin, but I gotta get one more hot take from you. What do you think of Mercurial okay. Spell Dancer? Mercurial Spell Dancer. Is that the 2-1 uh, oil counters? Yeah, 2-1 unblockable that uh, gets oil counters I think that card cast non-creature spells, and then you can copy spells by taking oil counters off of it. I think that card is really, really powerful. Yeah, me too. I think that people are dismissing it. Ju- like It's literally one of the things that I said, because it has oil counters. They're like, oh, I'm not doing the oil counters thing. Well, just replace it with charge counters or or extra spell counters. Or spell dancer counters. Yeah, but exactly. Then you can't say well, you're the, oiling the it up when you cast non-creature spells. Which, that's true. That would be a big loss. Oh, that's really good. It's stick with that's me really forever. Good. Yeah, I, I, um, honestly, I think this yeah. card suffers from a similar thing. Like, I think it suffers from the underperformance of cards like Arcane Proxy, where it's like people see this and they're like, "Oh, something in the Snapcaster ballpark," and they're like, "Well, it's probably not as good as Snapcaster Mage." But 
I think his card is, yes, is much closer. It's a creature that's not as good as Snapcaster Mage. That is true. Well, we well have, there's a there's a lot below there's a lot of creatures below Snapcaster Mage. I would say most of them. Honestly, I think this is a lot closer to like a Dreadheart Arcanist than Snapcaster Mage. And Arcanist was banned in Legacy. Snapcaster Mage is not even really played in Legacy that much. So I don't know. I think this card is also really powerful, and I'm excited to play with it. I, my only like complaints about this card is that it's just a big wall of text, right? Like I feel like it just it's not yeah. the cleanest card, and that's evidenced by the fact that I think a lot of people just didn't quite understand the tempo of how many spells you could copy and how many you had to cast to like, get it to trigger, just because it is a big well, paragraph to figure it out. Well, when you if you remove two to copy something and you cast another spell that you copy, you put another oil. Count. Exactly. Yeah, you're already halfway to filling up your, your <laughs> yeah, next spell halfway to, to copy. doing it. Yeah. Pretty messed I agree. up. Now I will say, in defense of Snapcaster Mage and Legacy, as a Legacy player, Snapcaster Mage didn't get banned because they banned the other cards in the deck that it was in when it was in Miracles. It was played in that deck and right. they got rid of that deck. Yep. So for what it's worth, you just get Murktide Regent now. If you're going to spend two man on a blue creature, it might as well be an eight eight flyer instead of a Snapcaster yeah. Mage. Yeah, you're not wrong. Justin, thank you so much for giving us so much of your evening. Uh, it was a delight always talking to you. Uh, what do you want to tell people about? You're streaming over on... Uh, you, actually, are you streaming or you're just putting videos on YouTube? What, what is your whole content yeah, schedule? Primarily YouTube. So I I'd stream like once a month. Okay. And that's mainly for special stuff. So I have a YouTube channel that I am releasing a lot of... Currently like a lot of arena content. So I'm doing cube drafts on arena when that's available. I've done a ton of those. I'm doing historic brawl on arena. I basically do all of the singleton formats. And you can find that at youtube.com slash at jparnellmtg. That is the way to get to it. And I would love if you would come and just check out some of the stuff I have. Like I said, if you're interested in cube, I have a bunch of that. I am going to be releasing probably... Well, not probably. At probably the end of this week when this episode comes out. A cube diary for magic con philly that i can't wait to watch it all of the cubes that i i am way over my head on putting this all together i filmed it and then i'm like wow i don't i've never done this before you got so a lot of footage i was like watching you record two, i was like two That's and a half hours be a lot of work to edit that down is what i was thinking <laughs> yeah two and two and a half hours and it's going to be uh you know about like a fifth of that when it's when it's all said and done so yeah, it's um, it is uh, taking me significantly longer because I don't, I I've not done anything like this before, but I'm pretty excited about it, and it's going to be comprehensive of everything that we did. It's going to really cover the rotisserie draft more in detail than we even talked uh, as far as interacting with all of the rest of the players that participated in the draft. So, it's I'm also really looking forward to it, but uh, I'm I'm slightly intimidated by the remainder of the process that I have to do. So, anyway. You can also find me on Twitter. That's where I'm most so active on social media. That's at jparnell1 there. And those are really the only two places that I'm going to point people to. So Check out yeah. this man's YouTube channel. You know Justin is uh, is a lover of Cube, so even if you're watching and play other singleton formats, the spirit, the spirit of the kind of magic we all love is there. Definitely. All right, we got to wrap up there, guys. boys. Thank this you. Is... Yeah, thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry for interrupting you as the host, but I just want to say that I've not been on the show in quite a while, and this is the first time I've had to just sit and just talk about Cube for two hours, and I absolutely loved it. I'll be on any time whenever you guys want. Justin, you, you are welcome me. back whenever, so we will definitely have you on in the future and uh, make it happen okay, more great. often, because yeah, it's, uh, it's a kick great out, time. Kick out Ryan next week. I'll be back then. <laughs> okay, sure. I'll <laughs> let him, I'll let him know kidding. that our schedule <laughs> filled up, and uh, you can just come back and just expound on more ways that your stats were better than his <laughs> in the rotisserie draft, even though he technically got the win. Get some he, more he, of that he really just he, got the win on a technicality. He's being really like pedantic about it, you know? No, he won. He won fair and square. And thanks again as well for putting together this rotisserie draft. This was really a lot of fun. One of the coolest cube things I've done in a while. Great. Well, you can look forward to it for CubeCon coming to you, Madison, Wisconsin, October 19th through 23rd this year. And I would love to run back another rotisserie draft with people that are going to be going to that. So Let's do it. Looking forward on, to it. Put it on your calendar. Uh, we will be there. So uh, check it out, people. All right. That's it. Uh, speaking of editing a lot of footage, I got to edit this whole episode. So uh, that's it for this episode of Lucky Paper Radio. Thank you for tuning in. All of our music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. This show is produced by Anthony and I and Justin, thinking really hard about magic cards, playing a big rotisserie draft, and then talking about it into microphones. Thanks, both of you. Thank you. Thank you.